Hey, how's it going everyone and welcome back to another video. We got a fun one in store today. We're going to do another solving real world data science problems video. So basically how this works is that we're going to walk through a data science project and particularly in this video, we're going to be walking through a web scraping project. And as we go through the project, I'll be presenting tasks for you to work on independently. So you can kind of pause the video, try out the task, and then whenever you're ready, you can resume the video and see how I would go about solving the problem. You guys seem to really like the last time I did this. So I figured it was due time that I did another one of these. The specific project that we're going to be working on today is going to be scraping through a bunch of Wikipedia pages on Disney movies and building up a data set on that information. So we'll be using libraries like Beautiful Soup, Requests, we're also gonna throw in some unit testing stuff, so PyTest and a bunch of others. And ultimately the real goal of this is to uh, help you learn how to solve real world problems. And ultimately uh, one of the biggest questions I get is, you know, what library should I learn to get a job? The answer to that question is really, you just need to learn how to solve problems uh, in data science and learning how to do that is what's gonna ultimately help you find jobs and kind of continue your growth in data science. Once you've built up this data set, you'll be able to answer all sorts of cool questions about Disney movies, like what was the worst ever Disney movie uh, released? And you'll find out that, oh, uh, it was uh, a Jonas Brothers 3D uh, movie experience rated terribly on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. So you'll be able to do fun stuff like that. I think I'm gonna leave the analysis for a follow-up video but uh, we're gonna have a, a lot of fun, you know, walking through all sorts of tasks, just building up this data set. Before we begin, I wanna give a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and that is DataCamp. For those of you familiar with my channel, you probably know that I'm not always the best about posting frequently, and you may be looking for more resources to continue learning. I apologize for not always posting, but each time I post, I wanna make sure I deliver a lot of value. My ultimate goal is to help you become better programmers and better data scientists. And I think that DataCamp is a platform that can help you do this. DataCamp offers over 300 courses that combine short expert videos with hands-on exercises. They offer courses on all sorts of Python topics that range from the basics to advanced topics like data visualization, probability and statistics, and machine learning. One thing that I really like about DataCamp is that the lessons are bite-sized and you can really fit them into a busy schedule. They even offer a mobile app that can allow you to take your exercises and your courses on the go. To get started with DataCamp, I left a link in the description. Make sure to click on that. You'll be able to access all of the first chapters of each course for free and then to get unlimited access to everything that DataCamp has, the subscriptions start at $25 a month. All right, to get started, open up your preferred code editor. For this video, I recommend a Jupyter Notebook. So I'll put some instructions on how to set that up uh, in the description. You can also use Google Collab as a browser-based option. Once you have that open, you also wanna make sure that you open up a web browser. And we're gonna start off, and I'll also have this in the description, going to this Wikipedia page that has a list of Walt Disney Pictures films. And ultimately this is what we're gonna be scraping when we're building up our data set. So as we see here, we see all these tables with uh, a bunch of different Disney movies that were made over the years. And ultimately what we're gonna be trying to do is t going to each one of these links, scraping some information and then saving that. So let's just pick one of these to kind of start with. I'm gonna go to one of the newer ones. Let's start with how about uh, Toy Story 3. So click on that link. Okay, so if we look through this page uh, and try to figure out like where the best spot to get, you know, the information that we want to include in our data set, uh, you could scroll all the way through it, but what I would say with any Wikipedia you, page you go to, or pretty much any page, you usually have this info box on the right side, and that has all sorts of useful information, like the, the director, you know, who it's starring, uh, you have like budget, box office, et cetera, running time. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna ultimately scrape this info box for all of those pages we just saw. 
So to present the first data science task, for a single page, so let's do this Toy Story 3 page, let's scrape that and store it in a Python dictionary. So scrape all of this information you see here and store it in a Python dictionary. And, and I recommend using Beautiful Soup Library to help you do this. If you're not familiar with Beautiful Soup, I have a full tutorial on Beautiful Soup, so be sure to check that out. But feel free to pause the video, try out the task of storing all of this inf scraping and storing all of this information for Toy Story 3, and then resume when you want to see the solution. All right, so the first step of this task is going to be to just load in the page. So to do that, I feel like you can break it up into some simpler tasks, but you know, really the first thing is to just uh, import the necessary libraries. So I'm gonna just say import necessary libraries. So what are we gonna be doing using to scrape a page? Well, I think that we will want to, first off, import probably the beautiful soup library. So I'm gonna do from beautiful, beautiful, ah, beautiful soup for import beautiful soup as BS. This is like, this is how I like to do it. and. Again, just feel free to watch my web scraping tutorial if you want to see a bit more about Beautiful Soup before we kind of jump into things in this video. Then the other library that I think is going to be important is going to be the requests library. So we'll load those two libraries in. Next, we'll just want to simply load the, the page. So I'm going to say, you know, the next task is to just load the web page. So how can we do that? It's pretty straightforward. We're gonna to wanna to use requests to load in the content. So we can do r equals requests dot get and https, let me just paste in the link. We're gonna do that Toy Story 3 page like this and that should load it and then we will want to convert it to a beautiful soup object. So we can do that as follows. We can do soup equals beautiful soup of r dot content. And as a reminder, really a lot of the things, if you don't know how I'm kind of discovering, my normal workflow is Google searching how to like convert a web page, you know, how to load and convert a beautiful soup web page. So I always recommend just, you wanna be thinking about what you need to do and then just use Google to your advantage to figure out the exact syntax. And so we have the beautiful soup object, but it might also be nice to just uh, print out the HTML. So to do that, we can do contents equals soup.prettify. And then within the Jupyter notebook, I can just type in contents, but you could also just print out contents here. So let's see what we have. Oh man. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is all of our HTML. There is a lot here. Uh, it's gonna be tough to work right off of this. So let's try to narrow down what we need. We're actually real quick, just try to print out contents and see if that actually looks better. Oh yeah, it does. That's a little bit more manageable to read. So, I mean, this is the Wikipedia page, but still <laughs> there's a lot. And as we mentioned, the task right now that we're trying to do is to just get that info box. So let's go back to our Wikipedia page. And when we're trying to get a specific thing in a, on a web page, what you want to do is use your browser to your advantage. Most browsers support this, right click, and inspect on the element that you're curious about. So as we see here, if I kind of hover over things here, we get this full table, which is called info box uh, V event. So really it looks like to me, if I'm not mistaken, I'm gonna try to just scroll down a bit. Yeah, it looks like if we grab this table, we're pretty much good to go to get this information. So let's just narrow down our HTML content and just get that table. So to do that, we can use our soup object that has everything on the web page. We can do soup.find 
and let's pass in the class. Because class is a Python built in, we have to do class underscore the syntax for the soup, beautiful soup. And we're gonna do at equals, I think it was info box space V event. So that should allow us to grab uh, that table. And if you wanted to be more particular, you could you know specify that this is a table element, but I think we'll probably be good by just grabbing this class. And I'm gonna just define that just so we have it saved as a variable as info box equals soup.find class of info box V event. Um, let's see. And now let's just print that out real quick. And the printify command helps you with beautiful soup just to get a nice like indented HTML syntax. It's a little bit more easy to process. Okay, so what do we have in the info box? And it does look like we got that right table. So the first thing we see is the name. That's gonna be very important for us to save the name uh, in our Python dictionary. If we go down, we see, I think that this is probably the image that was in the, the table. Let's see, okay, we got like down here, the director, producer, and let's just see the syntax here. We see that all of the items that we really wanna grab, we first wanna grab the title, and then I would say we wanna grab all of this stuff here. So what I think it's important that we're gonna do is grab the table rows here as we try to build this. So let's start doing that. All right, to grab the table rows, let's build off of our info box, uh, beautiful soup object. So let's do a find all this time. And we're specifically going to be looking for a table row tag. So if we do that, we're gonna get a list of all of the different table rows. So this should help us out a lot. And it might be helpful to kind of just iterate and see what's in that list. So let's just do a for loop for row and uh, let's actually save this too. So maybe I call this info rows for row in info rows. Let's go ahead and do a print of row.printify. See what that gives us. All right, so it's just a little bit of a neater way to look at it. And we have a little bit of separation. So this one, the information we need is in the table head. Uh, we don't need the second table row, third. We see that basically how we're gonna separate this out is we get the key for our Python dictionary from the table head and we get the value for our Python dictionary in the table data. And that I think is the case for all of these. I guess you have some more complicated ones when you get to multiple selections. So we'll have to kind of handle that separately. If it's helpful, I also recommend using the inspect tool a lot down here. So like, as we can see, we kind of navigate to these table rows. You can open that up and see exactly nice and uh, simple kind of syntax, I guess, too to see what is what, probably an easier view, seeing them side by side than just through Jupyter Notebook. All right, so let's start building our dictionary out. We're gonna do this on a separate cell. So maybe close this out too. Okay, so I wanna get all these rows and basically save them to a dictionary. So I'm gonna start out by saving a empty dictionary. So movie info equals this blank Python dictionary. And then we'll probably want to iterate it through it just like we were before. So we'll say for row in info rows again. And if we remember what was in that, the first row, we just wanted the title. We didn't want all the other stuff. So we wanted to handle that a bit separately. So what I think was going to be helpful for us is if there's certain indexes that we need to hand, handle differently, it'll be nice to just know which rows those are. So I'm gonna use this enumerate keyword that allows us to both get the index and the row at the same time. All right, so for index and row, 
in an in enumerate info rows. So first off, I guess if index equals equals zero, that's the title row. So we'll probably just want to add movie info uh, title. equals row dot find. Let me open this back up just so we can see exactly what we need to find in there. We need to find the table head here and then we need to get text. So this once again comes back to uh, the web scraping tutorial that I've done before. If you don't see understand the syntax that I'm walking through right now, you definitely would if you watched that video. All right, so row.find, we want table head, and then we want to get the text there. So I'm just gonna do dot get text, and I think that that might be good. So let's see what we get uh, if we do that. I guess to start, we might as well just print movie info, just see if that first index gets handled properly. Looks, look at that, looks pretty good to me. Toy Story 3, cool. Um, all right, uh, what else do we need to do? Well, we don't really need the second indexed. So we can probably skip that. Um, I'm gonna just say elf, if index equals equals one, we'll just continue, because that was the picture. And else, this is when we actually wanna collect the table head and table data and put that into the dictionary. Well, let's just start very simple and go ahead and do, I'm gonna say the content key equals the row dot find of the table head and probably the get text out of that. And the content value is gonna be row dot find the table data and let's just remind ourselves, we see that the table data or the table head has the directed by, the table data has the um, the actual name. So that's why I'm saying content key and content value like this. So dot get text. And then what we need to do is just simply in our dictionary, we'll do movie info content key equals movie info or uh, equals content value. And let's see what happens now when we print our dictionary. Oh man, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little ugly, but I think it might be good. We'll have to work on this. All right, let's try to dig into why it's like pretty ugly like this. So let's just look through our dictionary. Well, we see that the first one worked fine. We see that the produced by worked fine. Screenplay looks good. Uh, story by, that's where we get our first ugliness. And it seems like it's because there's three different names here. So let's just go back to our web page and see kind of how we maybe should handle when there's three names. So I'll go to the story by here and Okay, so what is in that? So let's go to the table data here. We see this time, instead of just text, we have a div, and we actually have a list. So unordered list, and in the list elements here, we get the actual name. So I think we should have like an if statement that handles uh, the possibility of lists different than just other more straightforward ones like directed by, which is just directly in uh, the table data. I guess this one's within a link, but you can get the text much simpler there. So let's add that if statement into our code. All right, so I often like writing functions to do stuff like this, try to you know keep things a little bit more um, confined and like build up you know, don't have too much in this single like for loop. So let's build a function that we call get content value. And that's gonna take in a row. And what can we do with the get content value? I would say that if the row 
basically we want to break it into two cases if it has a list and if it doesn't have a list. So if row dot find of list, if that's true, well, we want to probably return a list that is going to be, and just bear with me here, we're gonna do list.getText for li in row dot find all of the list elements. So for each list item, so list li is list item, we're going to get the text for that list item for all list items in that row that has a list. That looks good. And then else, I think we can basically do what we were doing before. So we can just return uh, row find table data that get text. And actually, just to simplify this a little bit further, let's say that this is row data uh, instead of just the entire row. So instead, we don't actually have to do this anymore. It's going to be contained. So row data dot get text, and that allows us also to grab the list items directly in the row as opposed to as opposed to having to first get the row data then do that. So this should be row data. I think that's good. So and this should be row data. So now we want to have this be get content value of the row dot find table data. And let's see what this does with our Movie info list or movie info. Ah, not to find. What the heck? Honestly, if I run this again, it'll work because I'm in a Jupyter notebook. So it really wants me to have this above my for loop. So I guess I can make the compiler happy and do that. Oh, look at that. Looks a lot better. Toy Story 3, all the same stuff as before looks good. Now we have nice story by here. Uh, looks like this is all good, the starring. Looks like the music is good. Looks like the cinematography is good. Edited by is good. Uh, production company, ah, why is there not a space here? So. Might have to figure out what's going on with the space here and the, the name. Um, this looks good, except for we have this weird XAO character. Same thing with budget and box office. So let's just make some minor cleanups and then I think we're probably good for task number one. All right, to me, it looks like we need to do two main things of cleanup. The first looks like that we want to uh, replace any XA zeros, whatever this character is, with just a simple space. So that's just a string replacement. That should be pretty straightforward. The other thing that might be a little bit more difficult is like the word production company is like getting kind of smushed together. It's not separated by words. I don't know if that's happening anywhere else. Don't see it happening anywhere else. So let's just try to figure out why this production company looks a little bit off and do the string replacement. I think we'll start with the string replacement because I guess that's kind of a little bit more of a low hanging fruit. So if you forget how to do a string replacement, just feel free to do a Google search like string replacement Python uh, replace method. I like finding Stack Overflow posts usually uh, just because I feel like they usually have the best examples, but maybe we'll just try this Geeks for Geeks article. Okay, so string dot replace what was originally there and now what you want to be replaced there. So that's very straightforward. So let's just go ahead and where we do our get text, we'll want to do a string replacement. So get text dot replace. The old was anytime we see XA zero, 
We want to replace that with just a space and we'll want to do it for this spot too. X a zero with just a space. Run that, let's see if it improves things. Yeah, look at that. I don't see that annoying character anymore here. So that's solved number one. Second thing is why are these things getting squished together? So production company is the main one we wanna look at. I also see it like here, it looks like, motion pictures and Walt Disney Studios um, are right next to each other. All right, so what one was getting squished together? Production company, ah, look at that. Try to find it in the HTML over here, our inspect tool. Production company, what is happening here? So I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. There's all sorts of nice settings in Google Chrome that allows you to see this. Uh, preferences. Actually, I think I, all I have to do is do control plus inside of this. Control plus, yeah, it makes it a little bigger. So production company, we see, let's drop that down. We see we have a div in here. Ah, okay, so there's production and then company and they're separate, oh, this has a weird um, space after it too. So it looks like Maybe they're getting joined some way weird. Let's look up some documentation real quick. So I'm gonna type in here. Uh, I guess let's just look up the get text method. Get text method documentation, beautiful soup. All right, beautiful soup documentation. And I'm gonna look up get text, get text. Oh, okay, look at this. There's a couple of things here. You can tell beautiful soup to strip white space from the beginning of the end of each bit of text. That seems like helpful too, because I did notice a extra space. So strip equals two, let's make sure to do that. And, oh wow. You can specify a string to be used to join the bits of together, uh, text together too. So before, I guess by default, it's probably just no spaces at all. Um, but if we just made this a space here and made strip equals true, that should solve our problems, I think. So let's try that. Okay, so get text, we want to use a space, that was what was in the documentation, and set the strip keyword to true. And I guess we can just probably do this in every spot to be safe. And the nature of, I'm gonna just say this now, the nature of web scraping projects is they can get a bit messy because you have to handle edge cases. Um, you just have to handle edge cases and it can be messy to do that. So, Using functions is one way to make it a little bit cleaner, but you know sometimes it's just gonna be a bit messy with web scraping and that's just life, I would say. Okay, that looks good. Run it again. Nice. This looks good to me. Production company, that looks good. Walt Disney Motion Studios, that's good. Awesome. We have completed task one. Nice work, everyone. All right, let's begin with task number two. So let's go back to the Wikipedia page. Let me just close out the inspector real quick. So right now we're on Toy Story 3, but we actually wanna be on that list of movies that we showed previously. So we're at the list of Walt Disney Pictures films, and this will be in the description, this link. I also will include this link in the GitHub repo for this. So if you ever want to like start on a certain task, uh, I'll, I'll have in on GitHub all the code for each task. Um, so you can go to github.com slash Disney data science tasks uh, to, to see all that. All right, so what are we doing in this task? Well, if we look at this list, we see that we have all of these tables with, um, Disney movies and ultimately links to each one of these movies that looks similar to what we just scraped with the um, Toy Story 3 
link. So what our goal is here, so the task that's going to be assigned is just like you did for the Toy Story 3 movie, the new task is to go through every one of these items in these lists and scrape and collect that information that, that we just got for Toy Story 3. So you want to get the info box for all of the movies in, this, in these lists, in these tables. Before we get into this task, I want to say some logistical stuff about web scraping and some rules you kind of want to adhere to uh, as best as possible. So if we search up, so basically every website that we go to will usually have what's called a robots, robots.txt. And this basically tells us what we are allowed to do um, on a site as far as scraping goes. And usually for per, uh, personal purposes, you're pretty safe to scrape. Uh, pages, websites, but if you're ever doing anything more commercial, you really will want to read uh, robots.txt and just make sure that you uh, kind of adhere to what they're telling you to do. So I just looked up the robots.txt for Wikipedia. And basically what it says here is that there are a lot of pages on the site and there are some misbehaved spiders out there that go way too fast. If you're irresponsible, your access to the site may be blocked. So it's just really, Wikipedia is fine with us scraping their site, but it's just telling us to be responsible about how we do it. So I would say whenever possible, don't try to swarm Wikipedia servers with tons and tons of requests. Try to work slowly and kind of build up to where you need to get to and kind of limit how many times you make tons and tons of requests. Wikipedia provides a lot of information for us, so uh, just be, be kind as far as scraping goes. For other sites, you might see like, if we go to like, let's say eBay uh, robots.txt, um, you'll see here, the use of robots or other automated means to access eBay site without the express permission of eBay is strictly prohibited. Notwithstanding the foregoing, eBay may permit automated, et cetera, et cetera. So like eBay, for example, I wanted, I was kind of thinking about doing some crawling on eBay, but you know, according to the robots.txt, you're not supposed to be scraping eBay. So I just, that's a good uh, guide in general um, for what you can and can't do as far as scraping goes. Oftentimes if a site says you can't scrape it, they might have an API that you can use instead to access information. All right, back to the task. Quick clarification on this task. So the Ultimate goal is to have a list of Python dictionaries where each dictionary represents the info box for a specific movie. Feel free to pause the video and then resume when you wanna see the solution. All right, so the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do for this task is to just get that, you know, to load in that web page into uh, Beautiful Soup. So if we go back up a bit, uh, and just see how we scraped the previous web page. We can just kind of duplicate this behavior for our new web page. So I'm going to paste this in. And now instead of Toy Story 3, there's a different link that we're going to want to use. So let me go ahead and just paste in the, the list of Walt Disney Pictures films. So this is the page that we're ultimately scraping. If we want to see what it looks like, we can run this and see. Uh, it, it, once again, just printing this out uh, as a whole is a little bit challenging. So I think what's better is probably to go to the actual page and use the inspect tool to help us out here. All right, so I'm gonna just go ahead and click on inspect here. Ultimately, what I'm gonna be looking for here is, is there some common you know, class that all of these tables are in that I can utilize to kind of pull the information. We see down here, I'm gonna scroll this up a bit. We see table class equals wiki table, wiki table sortable, jQuery table sorter, etc. I'm curious, do all of these different tables have that? So we have it here. If we scroll down, do we have it at the next one? Wiki table, sortable, jQuery table sorter. It looks like it's there for all of these um, different tables that we're ultimately gonna wanna scrape. 
So I'm going to just click on this and copy in this, hopefully put somewhere. So let's say that movies is equal to soup dot, let's say maybe find all of um, class equaling this. And then just see what we get in uh, movies if we print that out. Uh, nothing, what happened? Um, hmm. I'm wondering if it's because there's spaces in this. What happens if I do like dots between these? Hmm. It's also not helping me right now. Let's go back to the page. Hmm, it should it should be there. That's the class, right? Uh, so what I'm going to say instead is I'm sure that there's some way to grab the class here with the find all, but maybe we want to instead uh, use the select method with soup. So I'm going to do soup dot select, and I'm going to just delete all of this. If you remember in the web scraping tutorial, uh, select gives us a bunch of different options as far as getting information from a table. So I'm just gonna load in a site uh, on CSS selectors and it has all sorts of useful information. So when I'm using the select method of beautiful soup, I usually reference this. And one thing to note here is that I can get specific classes using dot and dot. So if there's multiple classes like we have, we probably can use that syntax. So let's do that soup.select um, and we're now going to do wiki table dot sortable actually I just want to load that page in one more time yeah dot class okay so dot wiki table dot sortable maybe dot jQuery table sorter let's see what we get ah, still nothing I'm going to get rid of this jQuery table sorter I don't know what's going on with that Oh, wow. I don't know why that it must have been the dash or something that was throwing things off with the jQuery table sorter. Um, table class equals wiki table sortable. Or maybe that like gets populated later. But that looks good. Okay, let's go back and then kind of get a little bit more precise with what we're trying to get. which ultimately is all of these links right here. So let's kind of do some digging into one of these tables. So uh, let's look at the 19, oh, this one's open already. All right, okay, wiki table is sortable. We have table head and then we get into the table. There's a bunch of rows. Um, duh, duh, duh. Let's get into the table body, bunch of rows again. So let's open up one of those rows. First thing, it's table data within a table row. We have this, no, we want this one right here. So what's in this? So we have, look at that. So in the italics here, we have the, this is really what we're wanting right here is the reference link to that uh, Wikipedia page. And that's what's right here. We also have get the title. So I'd say the two things we really need from each of these items is the reference link to so we can do further scraping on it and then the title. So let's grab both of those things. And how can we do that with Beautiful Soup? Well, the one thing we could do is we saw that that was a italicized element. So we might be able to just specifically grab the italics from this type of table to get um, what we're looking for. And I see it's the only italicized element in this table. So I'm thinking if we just grab each italicized element in the tables that have that class, um, wiki table sortable, 
then we're probably good. Let's see what this gives us. Look at that. Um, that looks much better. I'm gonna just do like, just so it's a little bit less overwhelming, I'm gonna do the first 10. Okay, that looks good. That looks good. This is giving us stuff to work with so we can do the scraping. That's looking pretty good, I would say. Let's now, uh, you know, recurse into those uh, reference links. All right, so how do we get specific properties of a link? Well, what we can do is, let's just do it for a single example. So let's just take movie zero. We'll wanna grab the link element. So that's gonna be A. And then what we can do, if we wanna get like either the title or the um, link, the href, we can do in brackets here, href, and let's print that out. Oh no, what happened? Movie is zero. Okay, cool. That gives us the link. And then similarly to get the title, we would just make this title. And just to be clear how we're getting this again, let's just do movie zero real quick. Delete all this other stuff. And see that all of this stuff is contained in this link element. And I grabbed the href and we grabbed the title to get those two things. So that's gonna be important. And we're probably gonna to wanna to bake this into kind of like a, a function or something. So let's do that with the next step. So let's define a function called get info box. And that's gonna take in a URL. So really what we're gonna do in this function is just copy the code that we had from task number one. I'm gonna just copy all of this stuff. I guess specifically I wanna copy this stuff to start. Ah, oh, let's just copy it all in one go. Copy all of this into our get info box method. So let me just paste that. So this is a separate method, so I'm gonna move that above our new get info box method. We're gonna use it in that. So get info box, and then this stuff will all be happening in this method. All right, so we need to pass in a URL this time. So the other aspect of the info box for the Toy Story 3 was we had to first load in uh, the Toy Story 3 uh, web page. So we did that, I guess, right up here. I guess we're gonna also need to grab this stuff too. So we'll do both of those things in this function. Bear with me as we do some copy and pasting. All right, so that's now in the info box. And the last thing we'll want is just throwing this stuff into the get info box function. And this will all make sense in just a second, I think. All right. Cool. All right, so let's uh, start editing some of the contents that we just pasted in. Well, first off, uh, now it's not hard coded to be um, Toy Story 3. It's gonna be whatever our URL is here. So we can say URL here instead. Uh, you could keep in you know, the comments and whatnot, but maybe to clean it up a bit, I might just leave them out. Remove the print statement. Okay, so now we get our info rows and we see that we get our movie info here. And then probably the last thing that we'd wanna do is just go ahead and return our movie info. And really, I think that's all that we have to do to uh, turn this into a, a method that we can use for each URL that we have. All right, so let's just run that cell just so we have those loaded into memory. Next step will be to take this stuff up here. I'm gonna probably just paste this again. Basically, we wanna load in our list of Walt Disney films, load in the way that we're selecting it, and iterate through each of our selections and basically run this get info box function 
on every one and append to a list to get our final kind of output. So let's just, actually we don't even notice that we actually don't need this contents in here. That's just a pretty print it. So maybe I'll move all of this together. All right. Right, so that's, this is getting all of our movies that we're gonna to wanna to iterate over. And so maybe the next step would be to have a for loop that iterates over each of these movies. And I think it's often easier for a lot of these functions and these methods and you know code that we're gonna write. It's probably easier to do the enumerate method. So for index comma movies in enumerate movies, let's go ahead and we're gonna to wanna to grab some information. So I showed just a little while ago that you could do movie, actually that's sorry, movie in movies. Movie.a href would give us our, I'll say relative path and our title will be equal to movie.a um, title. I'm gonna just go ahead and print relative path and title. And then I'm just gonna break out of the loop real quick. Cool. Maybe I'll print a new line in between them so it's a little bit more clear. Cool, so yeah, this gives us the relative path and the title. Let's continue and I guess print this all out for each movie that we have. I'm gonna put a new line in between them. Uh, let's run this. Okay, looks like it's working. Cool, cool. It looks like it's getting it for all the movies. Oh no. All right, none type object is not subscriptable. So it looks like our kind of technique of how we're getting all of these isn't foolproof. So what I recommend in this type of circumstance is, you know, trying to do what we just did whenever possible. So I'm gonna surround this with a try accept. So try this. And if it doesn't work, Let's uh, print out the exception. So accept. Uh, accept, and I'm just gonna capture a blanket exception. Accept exception as E, and we can actually print out the exception. I'm gonna remove these print statements real quick. And what we could also do is maybe it would be helpful to print out the movie.getText. So just figure out what kind of text is happening, like what text we're dealing with when we get these errors. All right. Let's see what happens there. All right, escape from the dark. Uh, none type object is not subscriptable. The Omega connection, trail of the panda. So what I recommend doing is, you, you know, keep track of this list and see what's going on, why you're getting errors on these specific uh, movies. So let's go back to our list. And escape from the dark, that's the first one. So I'm gonna just copy this, go back to our list. Can I close out the inspect tool real quick? And I'm just gonna do escape. All right, I guess I can paste in what I just typed in, escape from the dark. Ah, all right. So it's over here in the right here. I thought that uh, only, you know, the only italicized elements were over here on the left, but we see that we have one over here. So it makes sense that it's giving us an error because this is not a link. So it doesn't have any uh, link uh, property. So let's see what the other ones might be. The Omega connection. 
The Omega connection. Okay, same issue as the last one. So we know kind of two spots where we'll have to fix something. Trail of the Panda. None type object is not subscriptable. Of the Panda, uh, okay. Looks like this just doesn't have a link. It doesn't have a Wikipedia page. So you could either decide to maybe investigate this uh, movie on your own, or you could just skip it. Uh, I would say either option is acceptable. Uh, Expedition China. What is that one? Okay, same thing. I'd probably just do this for each of them. Luca and Encanto are the other things. Luca, what's Luca? Uh, Luca also doesn't have a link. And it was Encanto. Encanto also doesn't have a link. So I'm going to say what we're going to do is we will figure out how to deal with the one, the italicized elements over here on the right, but I'm going to just skip the movies that uh, don't have links. It's just kind of too bad. If you want to investigate them on your own, feel free. All right. So these aren't huge deals. You could honestly leave them uh, being printed out as exceptions if you wanted to, but it's a pretty easy solution. All of them could be solved by basically they needed to have links and they didn't. So all we'd really have to do to not get errors on these items, we were basically just skipping over them, which is, I think, an acceptable solution, especially since some of the elements were in the wrong column, they weren't even um, movie titles, is we would grab the link element at, inside of a italicized element. So that would allow us to do that. And then instead of doing dot A, now we're actually grabbing the link element. Same thing here. So we do that. We see we get no more exceptions, and I could print the length of the movies. So 435 before, if we just did this, uh, it'd be 442. So those kind of seven issues we ran into now, everything else is there. Um, but we kind of avoid those exceptions. All right. so. Now that we're getting the title and the relative path, let's go ahead and try to get the info box for these things. So um, info, let's define a list called movie info a list equals brackets. Um, and then basically each time we we're gonna basically want to do an append of movie info list of the get info box for this relative path URL. So we probably want to have the full path. So the base path is going to be equal to just the Wikipedia kind of URL. So it would be something like this. And then we would append on the relative path. So basically what we could say here is that our full path would be equal to the base path plus the relative path. And then we would want to pass in the full path as the URL here. And just because I don't want to like make too many requests all in this first go. Let's go ahead and like break out of this loop. I'm going to add, this is just kind of for debugging purposes. So if index equals equals 10, we'll break out. So this will just limit us from going through every movie to start just to make sure we can debug things and fix things as necessary. All right, so what does movie info list look like since that ran? All right, title, Academy Award of Review of Walt Disney cartoons, that looks good. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, that looks good. So it looks pretty good so far. Let's just grab like the, the first element. Cool. 
So one thing that I do notice is that, uh, you know, it's not going to have, not every one of these movies will have every column and that's just life. Let's just try to collect as much information as we can right now. All right, given that we had no issues running it for the first 10, I think it's probably safe to go ahead and uh, run it for all uh, values. So now we're going to be basically making like 440 requests uh, to get those pages and get the info box. And we'll do that. It might take a second or two. So we want to limit how many times we run this full thing because this is kind of what I would say the Wikipedia robots.txt was saying is, you know, don't go too fast and we'll try to limit how many times we run kind of this for loop that iterates over everything. So let's do that. And notice we still are printing out our exceptions. So um, we, we can kind of dive into some of these uh, movies and see why they're giving us issues uh, after the fact. And I would say that this is kind of something that you, you find in web scraping projects is you want to automate as much as possible, but there are going to be weird edge cases that sometimes maybe you have to manually go in and, and fill out some information. Another recommendation when you're running a long script like this is, I guess there's two recommendations, is maybe printing out your index every like um, iterations of 10. So like index mod 10 equals equals zero, you'd print out the index. Another thing is, uh, depending on how long your script takes to run, it's sometimes good to periodically save your results because if, if it completely breaks out, you don't want to like spend 20 minutes of your time just to realize that you, you get an error at 18 minutes. All right, cool, it's done running. Let's see the length of our movie info list. All right, 427. So that was out of 435 total things that we had. So pretty good job, we did miss a couple. Um, so it's not perfect, perfect, but I think we should go ahead and save all of our, our dictionary data. And Python dictionaries map pretty well with JSON. So what I recommend is taking all of these dictionaries and saving it as a JSON file. Feel free to pause the video again if you wanna to try to do this on your own. It's kind of a subtask of the task. So I'm gonna go ahead and let's just make this a markdown cell. Save slash reload data. This is also nice to save and reload it. Um, if you like pause the tutorial and come back to it, you can just reload from where you started or where you left off. So to save the data, we'll do import JSON. Let's define a function called uh, save data. It's gonna basically take in whatever title you wanna save your file as and some data, which is gonna be the movie info list. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the file that we named title. We're gonna write it. And again, this is basically anything. If you see me typing out a, a long command like this, oftentimes, you know, I've done a Google search beforehand. And uh, it's like, for example, I would look up how to save JSON data Python. Um, I have JSON data stored in variable data. How do I do that? Um, and then, you know, these answers will basically be what, I think this answer right here is basically what we're gonna be using in our save data function. So you could have looked at that a little bit more intensely, but uh, coding equals UTF-8 as F. And we're going to do json.dump of the data and save it as the file f. Um, I'm going to say ensure ASCII equals false. And I'm going to just save it with an indent of equal to. You can save this to whatever number of spaces you want. Uh, that's good for save data. And now let's just add a... Um, 
another function which we call, I guess, load data. So import JSON again, in case you run these cells independently. Def load data. We just need to load the title now. And so with open, and I, same thing with this one, do a Google search on how to load a JSON file into a Python dictionary and you'll get your answer. That's, you know, I don't remember most of this stuff. Uh, I'm just know what I want to do and I Google search to find the exact syntax on how to do that. And ask any experienced programmer, they're probably going to tell you the same thing. You're going to memorize some things, but uh, it's really more important that you understand how to think about it at a high level. And then you can just do some searches on the exact syntax to uh, what you're specifically looking for. And we're going to do return json.load f. So now we can go ahead and save our data as, let's just say, Disney data.json. And the data we're going to use is movie info list. And basically, if we run this, I think we're good. You can check whatever repo you saved your Jupyter Notebook in, you can check that and see if it has the file. So I'm gonna do that real quick. So my data is in a Disney data science task folder. And as we see, we have the Disney data.json file here. I'm gonna open this with uh, sublime text. So open with sublime text. And if I pull that in, look at that. We have all of our data here. So I would say that's good for task number two. In task number three, we're gonna take what we just produced and do some cleaning of this data. All right, for task number three, we're going to be cleaning our data. And so that's a little bit ambiguous right now, but we'll dive into what we have so far and kind of break out some subtasks for this that you can kind of pause, try on your own and resume. So first off, maybe you stepped away from your machine or something. If you wanted to load in the data that we've uh, worked on so far, you can run this load data function and then you could just define movie info list equals load data. And this will also be stored on GitHub, uh, Disney data.json. And so if you hadn't, if you wanted, you're skipping just to this specific step, this is how you'd get caught up to speed. So now that we have uh, that Disney data, uh, actually let's look at the, the actual JSON file. I think that's gonna be helpful as we break out subtasks. So I'm gonna write some markdown here, subtasks. All right, so let's just look through our data and see if we can find different things that probably should be cleaned up. Um, all looks pretty good here so far. One thing we might wanna do is like convert dates into actual date time or like Python date objects. So we could probably use the date time library for that. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna scroll through. Okay, another thing that I see, I guess two different items here. Um, when we're gonna do analysis on this data, we're ultimately gonna want it, it to be in the right data type. So something like running time where it's 83 minutes here, we'll probably wanna convert that into an integer. So we'll probably wanna strip off the minutes and just store 83 as the number. Um, for budget and box office, similar type thing, it might be a little bit more complicated here. We'll want to convert these monetary values into numerical values that represent the, the monetary value. So like this would be 1,490,000 uh, instead of 1.49 million as a string. Another item I see as part of that is that we probably will want to remove these uh, references from our uh, data. So we'll have to figure out how to do that. Is there anything else we see? 
another reference. So how can I remove all of these? We're gonna have to also figure out a way to like standardize our data. So if we're doing analysis, it's a little bit tough if we have like, you know, a single value for one field and then like a range of values for another. We're gonna have to find, figure out, you know, some sort of way that we're fine kind of just taking, uh, you know, maybe 76.4 and converting that into a number, 76.4 million dollars, instead of like taking the high end of that range. So that will be another thing to kind of standardize our data. Who I see another item here. Um, so for whatever reason, if we look down here for this starring, I don't know what's going on exactly, but I see instead of this being a list like it's supposed to for a lot of the other uh, movies, it's like if we scrolled back to the top, we see like directed by, it's a bunch of uh, list items for these. We need to figure out why exactly this one's just a really long string. So that will probably keep us busy. There might be some other things that we'll stumble upon as we continue to go through, but we're gonna to try to get the data as clean as possible. And <laughs> I would say in general, Wikipedia doesn't give us the cleanest data. So this is really going to test our data cleaning abilities. All right, so what are some of the items that uh, we just mentioned? We wanted to do clean up references. So that was, you know, things like the bracket one. We wanted to convert numbers into, or convert like running time into an integer. I would say we would want to convert dates into a date time object. Let's see if there's other things. We wanted to split up the long strings. So that was, we saw that example right here. Oh, this is another one that looks like a um, bunch of different things all looped into one. So we need to figure out why these long strings are happening. We'll also want to convert budget and box office to numbers, or at least add an additional field that has them in numbers. That's a, a decent amount of cleaning items to do. That might kind of clear up most of the issues. And I would break this down a little bit further, and I would say that some of these tasks are ultimately gonna make us have to rerun this full code here. I guess another cleaning item is we probably should look at what's going on with these error ones. So what I was about to say was that some of these items will have to like completely rerun all of these uh, get info boxes probably to, to fix. So we probably should handle those first. So I would think that Cleaning up the references, we might want to just strip that out of the HTML uh, before we run everything. So that would be one thing. So clean up references. And then the other item I would say before we rerun everything would probably be to figure out a way in the HTML to split up the long strings, what is going on in those examples. So here are two items you can work on independently. Feel free to pause the video, try these items out and then resume when you're ready. We'll start working on the other cleaning tasks after that. So for these two cleaning items, uh, we're not actually gonna edit any code right here. I think what we'll wanna do is go back up to where we defined our get info box uh, method and also I guess where we got the info box for all the movies and probably edit that appropriately to factor in these, these, this information. So the first thing we're trying to do is remove the references. We're trying to move like things like this uh, from our results. So to do that, I think the best place to start is probably to just looking at uh, the HTML source code. So let's go ahead and click on one of the movies. Doesn't really matter what we click on, but I'm gonna go with Peter Pan. So over here on the right, we have the info box. 
And what we want to do is remove references like this. So the best way to go about doing that is right clicking, inspecting it, and seeing what the HTML looks like. So we see it right here, it's highlighted. And we see right above that there's a parent element sup, uh, which stands for superscript, not, uh, not saying hi to you. Uh, so if we look at all of these different um, tags here, the references, they all have the, the sup tab, the superscript tag. So if we remove the superscript tag, we're probably good at that cleaning item. So how do we go about doing that? And I think to make it easier as we test out changes, let's insert another cell. And here we'll like get the info box for a specific URL. So if we wanted that Peter Pan URL, paste that in. Um, so we see that that stuff is all in there right now. Um, but let's remove these references. So I'm going to do a handy dandy quick Google search. So you might type in something like how to remove script tags from um, HTML, beautiful soup. That will probably help you. Okay, I'm going to click on the first article here, removing tags. Find without find, that doesn't look like what we need yet. Prettify doesn't look like what we need yet. All right, I think we're getting to something. Okay, so to remove a tag using Beautiful Soup, there are two options, extract and decompose. Extract will return the tag that has been removed and decompose will destroy it. We don't need these tags, I would say, so I think decompose sounds like it will work. So it sounds like we just need to iterate over all of our tags that are of a specific nature, and we can just call decompose on those tags. Uh, and it looks like it's actually like basically doing our task here, so this is very helpful. So it looks like you could even do like a find all here. This could be very helpful and decompose it. Um, so let's try doing that. So I'm going to add a method. I'm going to just call clean, clean tags, let's say. And it will take in some beautiful soup object. And we'll just say for tag in soup.find all of the superscript tag, we'll call tag.decompose. Um, and so I'm going to just see if that works. I'm going to just throw that into our info box function. So clean tags. Uh, and our soup is defined as soup. I think I need to define this above just to make sure it's. OK, clean tag soup. Let's see what happens when we return the movie info now. Or we need to run this first, that's not gonna do anything. But if we call get info box, right now we see budget. It has the, the two here. We don't want that. We don't want it here either. So let's run it. Come on, look at that. It's stripped out. Nice. Um, so that's good. Uh, one thing that I kind of noticed as we were going about this was that if we look at the Wikipedia page for the release date, we see that it's just February 5th, 1953. But when we looked at it in the um, info box, we see February 5th, 1953, and then you see some other stuff. Not quite sure what this other stuff is, but I'm thinking I kind of want to get rid of it. Um, so let's just look at the HTML code. Uh, release date, release date. Scroll up, scroll up. So February 5th, 1953, I see a span here and it's in the span. So I guess I want to check real quick 
if um, this appears in all of our data, if it appears in all of our data, we might be able to use this for our dates, but if it doesn't, we probably can just get rid of it. So look at our data. And release date, I see it here. I'm guessing this is it at least. Uh, release date, I see it here, okay. Another release date, okay. I found an example where it doesn't exist. So um, this is our old data by the way too. So it still has the references, we'll have to regenerate this. So because I don't see this in all of it, I'm gonna say we can go ahead and remove the span tags as well, uh, in addition to the superscript tags. So let's do that. So clean tags. So I'm gonna say find all now, not just the superscript, but also the span, just so we can get rid of um, that extra information that it was passing. And I think sometimes it will, I think there was other cases I saw too where it passed in weird extra information like this. So let's see what happens if we rerun this and we rerun get info box. Cool, now it's just what we expected it to be. So that's uh, item number one there. All right, now that we've done that part of the task, let's uh, go ahead and do the second part. So I'm gonna just say that this is done. We're gonna have to rerun everything for, for all of the uh, code, but it's done enough. So let's split up the long strings now. And when I say long strings, let's look at our data again and find an example of what we mean. Uh, yeah, here's an example, just with the great locomotive chase. Uh, all these names, for whatever reason, are on one line. I'm curious, actually, if that was showing up at all with the Peter Pan movie. Look at the data there. Doesn't look like it shows up there. So maybe let's look at this great locomotive chase movie and see if we can fi find why the starring is not on, not a list like it should be. So let's go back to our Wikipedia list of movies. Great locomotive chase, where is that? The great, okay, found it. Okay, so we are having issues where the starring wasn't showing up properly. So I think what we can do is we're looking at the info box. Let's do some inspecting. So inspect this. Um, all right, so we have the table row, table head, starring. That looks pretty straightforward. What's in the table data? All right, so it looks like it's, even though it should be a list, they didn't actually include a list element or yeah, a list element in the HTML. Instead, there's these breaks. Um, okay, so we'll have to handle this somehow. How can we do that? Well, I would say that we probably wanna kind of write another if statement up here. So if it doesn't have a list, we don't wanna just return the get text because that will give us that long string we saw. So let's have an else if, and hopefully this handles multiple cases. We can do some checking afterwards. But basically we want the elf if, elf if, else, I can't pronounce else, elif condition to be maybe, if the row data, you can find a break tag, then we'll want it to enter into this one. So what can we do to combine all of those things if there's a break tag? Well, really, I'm curious if there's a way for us to kind of separate on the breaks uh, or just basically get the text that's in different elements all on the same level. Let's do a Google search. And I think what we'll want to look for is maybe just let's look at the get text uh, method again, the documentation for that. It might maybe have something that can help us here. So get text. 
right. It returns all of the text with uh, in the document or beneath the tag. Simple Unicode string. All uh, right. So what we found last time was like the strip command and also the separator. Uh, but at that point, you might want to use the strip strings generator instead and process the text yourself. Um, so it looks like we can return the separated elements as a list if we use this strip strings command. So I'm going to say, let's go ahead and try doing that. So where are we? Where are we? I'm going to paste in that code we just found. So text for text in soup dot strips, strip strings. Well, we don't want to look at soup. We want to look at row data. I'm curious what this will print out. So I'm going to just start with, and this was in a list comprehension. I'm going to just start with returning this. And we're going to need a movie that uh, has some, has an example of the long strings. So maybe we pass in the URL for that great locomotive chase movie. So I'm going to run that. And then instead of passing in Peter Pan, let's pass in the URL for the movie that we saw that had the long string issue. So that is this. And real quick, I just want to run it first time around without the code we just added, and then we'll run the code that we just added. So, okay, what happens the first time? So the first time we see that we have the starring all messed up with everything listed out one go. Um, but let's see what happens if we now add in this line. Okay. Oh, wow. Did it already work? So it is, oh, okay. I see what we just did. Uh, it looks like it's good. Um, basically before, whenever you're doing the, you know, get text and we're passing in the, the space here, we are joining all the different elements with the space character um, and thus getting a, a single string, which is what we wanted when we like separated uh, production, com production from company. But in this case, we, w we don't want to join it and so we're using the strip strings here to basically keep those things separate and, and not process them together and, and join them together. Uh, so it looks like just doing that for the break category, it works pretty well. I would like to do a like another check before I call this good. So let's find another example where this happens in our full list of data. So I see already, um, you know, this one also has the same issue, Davy Crockett and the River Pirates. So let's get that URL. And one thing that maybe would be good to store too, I'm not going to add this myself, but maybe you would want the URL in your JSON here. All right, Davy Crocker and the River Pirates. Okay, so paste in that URL. And I'm going to take this out to start, see what it gives us to begin with. Run this. Okay, yeah, we see that same issue where it's a big long string of three things. What happens if we now add in our line of code again? Nice. Looks pretty good to me. I do see that we have some issues here, like orchestration got separated from Edward H. Plum and Thomas Blackburn got lyrics attached. I don't know if it's gonna be that easy for us to handle this. What you might be able to do is just delete anything that's in parentheses 
uh, but that's kind of up to you if you want to take it a step further to, to clean this more. Probably would be It probably would be safe to clean anything that's in parentheses and just remove that. All right, I think we're pretty close to being able to run all of this again. The one thing I would say that we should do is just kind of do some investigating for why these things are failing here and maybe add some additional little checks into our code to handle those. So we can start with like Zorro the Avenger. So Zorro the Avenger, why did that not work? Go to the top. Oh, interesting. It looks like it like isn't even have a full info box because this is like a separate thing so uh, because this is an edge case I'd say I'm fine dealing that and I think the sign of Zorro is the other issue we had the sign yeah exactly so those just don't have an info box because they're part of some series I'm fine just skipping those one little Indian has no none type object has no attribute get text so let's go to one little Indian So where would that be happening? Let's do some investigating. So this looks good. That's just the title. We have the poster. We expected that. We skipped that over. Um, we have the next, ooh, interesting. Theatrical film poster. Oh, okay. Um, so it looks like this one doesn't have a table head same with the, the poster above. So now the first and the, so this is the zeroth index, the first index, second index, they both don't have a table head like most of these other ones do. So what we might do, add, add what modification we might make to our code is to add a check to see instead of maybe the if index equals equals zero and else if index equals equals one, I'm gonna get rid of this line and instead let's add a check to see if it has a header. Cause it seems like the issue with both the poster row and the row we just found is that it didn't have a table header. So if I do row.find here of table head and then I just do like an if statement if header and only if that is met, do we add the content to the um, info or to our movie info dictionary. I think that should solve that issue. We can test it by running uh, the one little Indian in our command, in our little cell right here. Pass that in. So run that, run this. Looks like it worked, but I think the thing to check is did it not work before? So I'm gonna just replace it again real quick. Run this cell and does it now work? Error. So it looks like we just fixed that issue. So replace it. Cool. So we've fixed one of the errors. I wonder if like the other ones had the same type of deal. All right, let us quickly look at the True Life Adventures one. So if we look at True Life Adventures, got a couple things. Hmm, okay. Interesting. Okay, I think that what's happening is that this is what's getting captured because this is in the same type of table. So, and it, this has the exact text, True Life Adventures, like we saw. If I click on that, uh, it's definitely not the same type of uh, a, a table as the other ones. So I'm gonna say that we don't really need to worry about this. This ultimately should be a bypassed link. So it's fine that it fails on this. Um, all right, and I'll just do one more check. I'll just check the nightmare before Christmas and see if that um, looks exactly like the error that we already fixed with the one little Indian. Let's 
just throwing that in here. Oh, look at that. Inspect. Table row, table row. It doesn't have a table head, that's right. Do any of these not have table heads? What is this one? Yeah, what the heck is this row? There's just like a missing row here that doesn't have anything. So that would be solved by the same problem that we just fixed with the other one. So I'm thinking that the rest are the same as what we solved with One Little Indian. So I think we're good at this point to rerun all of the movies and uh, save our new updated, cleaned up a bit uh, JSON file. So make sure that this is just run properly. And then let's go ahead and I think guess this time around, just to see the progress, I will print out, so if index mod 10 equals equals zero, I'll print out the index just to see how we're progressing. We should end up with like 435, I believe, around that, like 430 or so if it works properly. Run. Zero. 10. No errors yet. No, we, we expected Zoros to still have issues. We don't need to solve them because they don't have the same format as the other movies. True Life Adventure shouldn't be included, so that's a fine error. I think we're done. Yep, it's finished. Let's see what our total length is now of our movie info list, 432. And the only ones it broke on was True Life Adventures, which we knew wasn't actually supposed to be there. And then the other ones that were included just didn't have the info box, so we couldn't actually scrape them. But it worked on all the others now, so that's, that's good to see. Um... Let's go ahead and save our data. So run the save data cell. And I'm gonna just call this Disney data uh, cleaned. It's not as clean as we will want to kind of have for our final data, but it's getting there. So run this. And then you can go to your Jupyter Notebook repo or like the folder that it's in. So mine is right here. And we see that we have Disney data cleaned. I'm gonna open that with Sublime Text. And you should see better data than we had before. Um, there's still some things that we can you know, improve and we'll do that in the next uh, couple subtasks. All right, so if you stepped away from your computer by any chance, you can always reload the cleaned data by um, using our load data function and loading in Disney data cleaned. All right, so let's think what we've done so far on our cleaning subtasks. Well. We have cleaned up the references and we've also split up the long strings. So let's, as our next task, uh, let's convert running time into an integer. So to kind of be more clear what we're doing, so split up long strings is done. I'm actually gonna just delete this stuff out of the way. So to be more clear of what we're doing right now, let's just do like movie info list. Let's grab like, I don't know, 10th from the top item. And we see here that we have the running time. So what we wanna do is because this says 85 minutes, what we really want instead of 85 minutes is just the integer number 85 representing that time because that will make it easier for us to ultimately do analysis on this value. So feel free to pause the video, try to convert all of the running times into a new uh, key value pair, which maybe you call running time int, and it maps to all of these values as an integer. And then resume the video whenever you're ready to see how I would solve it. All right, so the first thing that I recommend doing is let's just see what the format looks like. So if it's always like number then followed by the word minutes, it's pretty easy to deal with, but it's kind of unclear if that's actually the case. So what I recommend doing is movie running time for movie in movie info list. 
And we can honestly just run this cell. Running time. Oh, okay. So what we should do, because sometimes they might not have a running time, we can do movie.get running time. And we'll just have to handle the none case uh, differently. Running time. And if it doesn't have running time, we'll just say uh, not applicable for movie and movie info list. Okay, and I might just print this so it's all uh, one line instead of hundreds of lines. Actually, maybe it's probably fine to scroll through this. So we have 41 minutes with like some additional info here. Um, 83 minutes, 65 min, so that's good to know. Um, this is a list that has 60 minutes. And I'd say in this case, let's just grab the first item in the list. So it could be a list, that's good to know. 90 min at 89 min, 80 min. It's, this one's weird, but it's a list. And once again, we can grab the first item that looks fine. If you really wanted to, it might be helpful. You could just like look how many times min occurs in these and see if it occurs in all of them. I'm just scrolling through very quickly to just check. Yeah. It looks like basically all of them have minutes or at least min. Or they're a list that has a couple values. A couple not applicables that didn't have the minutes listed. So we'll just have to kind of leave, leave those as none in our final solution. And yeah, some of the not applicables are probably for the new movies that haven't come out yet. Okay, good to know. So we can hide this. This will help us solve it. So how should we go about solving it? Well, I like to write functions when I'm doing tasks like this. So let's define a function called minute to integer. And it will take in the running time, so whatever we're actually getting at this point. Right from the top, something like a running time example that's very simple would be something like, you know, 85 minutes. And we also saw like 85 min as a possible way to do this. So what I'm thinking is let's just not even worry about what it says after this. We know that minutes is always occurring. So what we really can do if we just want this 85 is just split on this white space right here and just grab the element before the white space, so the 85. So what I think is the simplest thing to do is just take running time, so let's say uh, value equals running time dot split we're going to split on a space and then we're just going to grab the zeroth index because this would give us a list of 85 comma minutes and if we grab the zeroth element that just gives us the 85 and what we really want to do is convert this into an int so we'll surround it by int um, so if we now ran this on a test example we do maybe print and then we'd want to return value, turn value. So print minute to integer of 85 minutes, and we should get 85 as a number. We do, that's good. But we have more, I guess, difficult cases. So one of the more difficult cases was we saw we could potentially have a list. So we could potentially have something that looks like this, 85 minutes comma, let's say 70, you know, 90 minutes, maybe there's a longer version. In this case, I'm saying we should just take the, the first entry. You could maybe do more complicated stuff if you want to, but I'm gonna just say that that's how we're gonna approach this. Usually the first value listed is probably a safe value to utilize. So in this case, we ran the function. We're gonna get a break. Uh, you know, an error because it's expecting to run something on this, but in, in this case we have a list. So what we're going to do here is add in an if statement. So if we can say is instance and running time 
is a list. Oh no, what did I do? <laughs> we can then basically grab entry equals maybe running time zero. So we just get the first item in the list. And then we can do the same thing as before. So I'm gonna just add what our original code in an else statement, else. So entries running time zero. We just basically copy this, paste it in. And now instead of running time split, it's gonna be entry dot split. You can return the value, it's pretty good. And honestly, we could save ourselves a line instead of doing return value here. We can just do delete kind of the intermediary step and just do return this, return that. And same thing here, we can just do return of this. Cool. And even if we wanted to, we could make this the same as before. Zero dot split and just kind of simplify the line. So it really depends on what you want to show. You know, this might look a little complex at first, but uh, yeah, it's really personal preference on what looks better. So let's run this again. We see we get 85 in the list example. So that's great. Um, however, there's one other edge case we need to deal with, and that's if the movie.get is not there, they don't have the, the running time property. So we could maybe add another if statement here. So let's just say if uh, running time equals equals, ah, I keep hitting enter by accident, equals equals, let's say not applicable then we'll just have this return none. So that's like three different cases. So we have the first case if we couldn't actually get the running time and then the second two cases is we got the running time but we don't know if it's a list or a string. If we passed in then not applicable here, they'd give us none. All right, so let's now go ahead and add this to our JSON. How can we do that? Well, we can go ahead and do for movie and movie info list. We can add a new key, which we'll just call running time int. And that will be equal to, um, movie dot, or I guess we want to use our function minute. I'm going to say this is called minutes to integer minutes, minutes to integer of movie dot get of the running, running time. And if it doesn't find the running time key, then we'll kind of use not applicable as our fallback. So basically if we run this, I think we have completed the task as long as everything goes well. No, what happened? Oh, movie info, it should have been movie of running time because we're taking this JSON and we're Adding, or we're taking this dictionary and we're adding a new key to the dictionary. And because dictionaries are mutable, this is fine for us to do to actually change up movie info list. So run that. Now if we look up movie info list, let's say the negative 10th, get Hamilton again. We see we've added an additional running time um, value and it gives us the 85 we are looking for from this 85 minutes that's originally there and if we wanted to we can kind of repeat complete this step again and now just see all of our 
Look at that. Looks pretty good. These are all numbers. Didn't seem like it aired out in too many. There's a couple nuns in there, but that looks pretty good. All right, continuing on, let's now go back to our different subtasks. We have now, you know, done this conversion, so we can cross it off. All right, so now we have two additional subtasks left. We can either convert dates into date time objects or convert budget and box office to numbers. I think this one's pretty similar to the last one we did. So let's go ahead and try to do this. So just to make sure that the task is clear, you know, it's very similar to the last one. One of the properties of these movies, so movie info list, we'll just grab like the negative 30th element, whatever one matter, it doesn't really matter, is we see box office and budget. So ideally, you know, these are string values right now, but ideally we could convert them into a number, a number just like we did for running time. Um, so that's the task. Feel free to pause and uh, attempt it on your own. I will note that there's a lot of uh, ambiguity, uh, ambiguity in this task. So like for example, um, 120 to 133 million, uh, it might not be clear whether you should take 120 million or 133 million or not. So you're gonna have to kind of make some decisions on what you think is best. Like in this case, I would say go with 120 million and we'll just say you kind of go with the first value listed, but you could maybe take an average if you wanted. Um, also to help you kind of just stay and do this task the same manner that I would, um, I added some to the Git, Git, GitHub repo, I added some tests that you can run to see if you're doing a good job. So what I recommend for this task when you're working on it is that there's this file called conversion.py. So given a money value, if you fill out this function and return it as an integer or float, um, you can use this exact function in another file, which is test money conversion, which is PyTest, and you can basically run a bunch of cases and see if your function does the proper thing for each case. So this is a, a very like fun way to um, work on implementing some things like working on converting 1.234 million, that would equal this number. And I can make this a little bigger so you can see. So, you know, 99 million would equal this, 3.5 million would equal this. So you can use these tests to help you out, but you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna fill in so you can download this folder locally and you'll wanna try to implement this money conversion function and then you can test things using PyTest. And I'll show that a bit as we go. So going back to our Jupyter Notebook, I think one thing we'll wanna look at before we dive really too deep into the task is just to look at what our um, values look like. So we can do movie budget, let's say, for movie in movie info list, and we can print this out. Oh, we have to do the get again. Okay, so it's worth looking at some of these values to see the different types of syntax that we have. So you have like, I would say a dollar value followed by a quantifier on the dollar values, like 1.49 million. We also see we just have some straight up uh, dollar values. You see that a bunch of these are not applicable. Uh, so a lot of them don't have a budget listed. So we'll just have to work with the budgets that we have. You have some weird edge cases here. You have like, this one that says 60 million Norwegian kroner, which is around $8.7 million. So it'd be nice to grab the 8.7 million US dollars from that. Uh, let's see if there's any other edge cases. I see again, we have just like running time, we have some lists uh, that we'll have to deal with. So a lot of different things to consider. We'll just do our best job 
you probably can always make it better, but let's just do what we can. All right, so to you know complete this task, we are going to go ahead and fill out that function that I mentioned you can fill in and test out the pie tests. So let's go back to the GitLab repo. Um, you know, that folder was in helper and there was all these files here. So if you want to, if you want to download this, there's a couple different ways you can go about it. You can clone this repo, you know, fork this repo and then clone it locally. And I'll have instructions. I'll add instructions to the readme on how to do that. You can also click this green button up here and download the zip uh, folder of all of this. So that's another way to get these files locally. You'd have to download the zip and then extract the files to wherever you know you want to work on your code. So two different ways. I've you know done that. And let's go ahead and open up a file, the file that has this function. And I'm also gonna open up the uh, test cases here. So let's start simple and just keep building out things. You know, try to like hit as many of the cases, the test cases as possible first, and then you know go from there. So to start off, let's just focus on this type of case where. It's, you know, a dollar sign followed by some sort of number. And if we look back at what types of edge cases we might run into, and I think the one big thing to see with all of the values basically is that anytime we really want to get the actual value, we usually see the dollar sign. So that's going to be kind of a key indicator for what we're looking for. So in a complex example like 60 million Norwegian kroner here, with the 8.7 million in parentheses sees out here, we're gonna to wanna to start searching once we see that dollar sign and maybe like kind of strip out most of the other stuff. So that's like one thing to keep in mind as we go about doing this. So let's think how we can do this. And off, you know, this is really striking me as patterns. And so whenever we're dealing with patterns, I would say that we want to be thinking about regexes. So I'm going to import the regex library here as kind of one of the first steps. And what does our regex pattern kind of look like that we might be searching for? Well, I think the biggest thing is that we want to see a dollar sign and then followed by that dollar sign, we want to capture some sort of number. And so in my eyes, a number is, you know, 12.2 is a number. 790,000, you know, it could be like 0.57 is a number. But I think the biggest thing is we want some digits followed by maybe a comma and then some more digits followed by maybe a decimal point followed by some more digits. So let's try to capture that in a, a regex. So that's going to be the first thing we do. Number equals and just to make it a little bit easier to see what we're doing. I'm going to delete uh, most of this stuff and just clear it out of the way just so it's a little bit uh, easier to see exactly what we are specifically looking at. I'll keep the, the cases there just to make it, uh, I think these are helpful. So a number. Well, in regex terms, we can use uh, R for kind of raw text and this will format the regex nicely. But we want to find digits. So to find digits, we could do backslash or yeah, backslash D and regexes, regular expressions are pretty difficult. They can be hard to grasp. So if you're not familiar with regexes, uh, you know, this part might be a bit confusing. I'm going to make a tutorial on regexes at some point, but they are a super, super powerful tool. So I, I recommend playing around with them and trying to learn them. I'll link in the description some resources uh, if I haven't already made my tutorial that um, will be good for regular expressions to get started. But you can do all sorts of really cool pattern matching stuff with them. So I really recommend you uh, try to get the hang of them. So one thing we can do is just do digits. So if I did like backslash D plus, that would be any number, one or more digits it would match. And then we can kind of do stuff like print regular expression dot search. And we see we need the patterns. The pattern here is number. 
the string that we want to deal with is going to be, let's just say like one, two, three. And we can see if this is true or false, that this is a number, the one, two, three here. So I can run that. And we see we get a match here, which means it is. If I made this like just ABC, I ran that. We'll see we have none. So this is a very simple, just searching a very simple pattern, which is the, the digits plus. But we need more than just digits, right? Because if I did 12.2 right now, it might actually match the 12. Um, so let's run that. So it does get a match, but we can figure out what the match is. So it's gonna be the first full match it finds with the search method. So if I do dot group, we can see what the match is. And we see it's just 12. And we really wanted it to be 12.2 here. Um, so, what can we do? Well, we can follow one or more digits by an optional period. And a period is a special regex character, so if we actually want to specifically mention a dot, we have to do backslash period, and then we can do zero or more of that, followed by, let's say, some number of digits again. So zero or more digits. So now if I do 12.2 here, we get 12.2 because we've added in the pattern that it might have an optional period followed by some more digits in it. So we're getting there with our number and capturing numbers in our um, pattern. So what else would we wanna add? Well, what I see here is if we added, you know, 790,000 here, it's not gonna know how to deal with the comma. So what we also wanna add is the possibility that we have a group, I'm gonna say, of comma followed by three digits followed by, you know, and that's the, the end of the group. So what this is saying is that we have some sort of digits, so 790 would be one or more digits and then optionally, we could follow it by groups of three uh, digits with separated by commas, and then that could be followed by an optional period followed by some digits. And I wanna make this zero or more because we don't necessarily need to have these groups. So let's see what that matches. 790,000, perfect. So I think if we grab like 0.25, I can show too that that would be full thing. So this allows us to grab numbers. So that's a good start. So I think the first case we want to handle in our money conversion function is something like 790,000. All right. So with grabbing this number, I think let's see if we can handle a couple of our initial cases. So what we're going to do is say money equals, and we'll capture this stuff here. Or maybe I'll just say like value equals because we're using money as our input variable equals right next to search the number up here. And now instead of this string, we're going to pass in whatever we pass into our function. So money and honestly taking the group of that and we probably just want to return the value here. But we, we need to make sure we make it an integer instead of whatever this is going to return. So maybe like int or you could do float. Float might be more uh, appropriate because you can have decimals potentially in your numbers. So I'm gonna say float of all of that and we can return the value. And so if we tried doing something like print money conversion of 790,000 and that has, uh, our example has dollars. Let's see what happens. <laughs> we get an error, yay. Cannot convert string to float. Oh, okay, so I grabbed the, the comma, so we'll have to actually strip that out when we return our solution, so we'll keep that in mind. Strip out commas before solution. Uh, but let's say we just had like $790. Would that work? Yeah, that gives us 790.0. 
But uh, let's just handle the 790,000 case real quick. So we have an issue because there's a comma in that. So I'll say value string equals this stuff right here. And then maybe we could say um, value equals float of the value string dot replace any comma with just empty space. Because that would then make 790,000 with a comma, just 790,000. So return value and you know I, I kind of like to figure this out and then maybe clean up code a bit and that looks good cool so 790,000 turns into this that's perfect that's what we want so as a starting point we have a very very basic solution this obviously is not going to handle 12.2 million yet if we type that in we can see for ourselves it's probably going to just return us 12.2 so there's more cases we need to handle, but let's just show how we can use those tests to our advantage. So I recommend opening up some sort of terminal window and navigating to wherever you have that test money conversion file that looks like this. Ultimately, we want to run this with PyTest. So what that looks like is if I, I'm going to have to navigate in my terminal window. So for me, it's in YouTube slash code slash data science slash real world scraping. And then it's in the helper folder. So I need a CD to the helper folder. And now we see that the file is in this um, directory. So if I run PyTest test money conversion, it will run our function on the tests. And we see we had four that passed and <laughs> 11 that failed. So let's see if we can find the ones that passed. So it looks like four in the middle there passed. So let's look at what ones passed. So the bottom three failed, but oh, it looks like all of these um, four passed. So it makes sense. These are the ones with the commas particularly in them. Um, one thing that's interesting is that this one failed and ultimately that's because it probably took the 60 because I was just looking for a number instead of taking the 8.7. So I also want to add into our check that it has a dollar sign before it. Um, this one's a list, so I also have to handle lists. So there's really, if we look at these tests, there's two ma major cases that we need to break it up into. I'd say that there's this like word syntax. So like it's a, a value followed by some word that quantifies it and we need to handle that. So we'll probably have an if statement to handle those cases. And then um, we just also need to make sure that we only start searching for a number at the, the finding of a dollar sign. Okay, so let's start uh, kind of making this a little bit more concrete. So let's call this um, format, I'm going to call it the value syntax. And I'm going to call this format the word syntax. So basically we'll want to add a regex to capture both of these cases. So the, no, the value syntax I think is a little easier to find. It's basically look for a dollar sign and then capture the value with the number as we did before. So I'm going to go ahead and um, just move this down a bit. I might abstract this stuff into its own function. So I'm going to define a function that's called um, parse value syntax. It's going to take in some sort of string that's close to the, the value syntax that, you know, it has like a string like this and it's going to do what we did before. So now instead of money, this is string. I think that's all we have to do. Cool. And then now what does money conversion look like? Well, first off, we need to figure out if the value syntax exists. Um, so 
we'll do a regex search just like we did really with this one. It's gonna be very, very similar. So regex search. This time though, instead of just grabbing the number, because we saw it failed uh, one of those cases, it failed the one with 60 million Norwegian kroner. I mean, obviously I guess it would have failed because of this anyway, but we, want it, we don't want it to just pick up the first number it sees. We wanna make sure it has a dollar sign in front of it. So what we can do here is a very similar regex, but this time we're searching for the pattern that will be, I'm gonna format this raw. It's going to be dollar sign, and dollar sign is a, a special character, so we have to precede it by backslash. And then we'll put, followed by the number that we're looking for. And to make sure we can read this in as a variable, because I wanna basically populate this in, but I don't wanna, uh, I wanna keep it neater. So I wanna keep this just called number. I can make this an F string. So you can make it kind of two multiple syntaxes. So if we find a dollar sign and then a number, we're gonna call that the value syntax and we'll pass in, we'll be searching for that in the money string. Um, and then we'll get the actual match there by doing dot group. So that's value syntax. What does word syntax look like? Well, word syntax is something like dollar sign followed by 12.2 followed by the words million. If we look at our test cases, we see millions one, billions one. I also put down thousand as an option. So that's kind of the basics of it. I guess there's also the edge case that it's like 3.524. So that's like a a separate case, but let's just handle the generic case. So I'm gonna to to define another string that I'll call amounts, and this will be another regex. I'll say that it's, if we see thousand, if we see million, or if we see billion in our string, and I see I spelled thousand wrong, um, we're gonna be searching for that, and this will make sense in a, a second, I think. Um, but what does that standard, the word syntax look like? Well, the word syntax, so maybe I, I honestly might pull up, might move this out of this. I'll call this value regex equals that. And then I'll just replace this with value regex. And I'll similarly do word regex, I guess because I defined word syntax above it. I'm gonna find it above it here. Word regex equals, well, it needs to be a dollar sign. So we can do, I'm gonna make this the same type of string. Dollar sign, followed by a number again. Okay, that's simple. Followed by a, a space, followed by one of the amounts. So I guess the space is slash s, followed by optionally, one of the amounts. And to make this very clear, I'm gonna surround these with parentheses too, just to kind of group them. Because I think otherwise it might match it too quickly. I want all of these to be together. Okay, word syntax equals that's basically it, because it's dollar sign followed by some number, followed by some sort of, a, followed by some white space, followed by some sort of amounts. So let's see if things start matching that. So just to make our life easier, um, like pass on this real quick. Print, uh, re regex.search word, regular expression, followed by, let's say, 12.2 million. And we just wanna see if we get a match here. Oh wow, it worked, cool. And would it match something like 12.2 to 13 million? I don't think it would, yeah. That gives us an error. So it, fix, it handles the, the most basic case, which is good. Um, we can start building onto that. So optionally, we saw with our regular expression, actually, let's, let's just get this working and then we can handle some of these edge cases. So 
we'll say word syntax equals regular expression dot search of word regex and then followed by money. And I'm actually not gonna grab the group yet. This is really gonna just be whether or not the syntax exists. And just to make that clear, we'll just do if word syntax print word syntax um, elif value syntax print value syntax and then also maybe it would be helpful to print out value syntax dot group and print out word syntax dot group because this the dot group is actually showing us what our match is so let's just run a couple examples so print money conversion of 12.2 billion we see that we get a match there and i guess instead of i could do a return too but that's why we're seeing a none here uh, if I try, let's say, 790,000, we get value syntax. What if we did something like 700, like kind of made it in the middle, like 790,000 million. This would be weird. I don't know why we would do it, but what would this match? Okay, that matches the word syntax. That's cool. So really, it it's we want to, I think, I would say, because the value syntax is a subset of the word syntax. I think we wanna have this if statement for word syntax before L, uh, the value syntax, because otherwise if we did something like, you know, $790 million here, it would match just this for the value syntax uh, when really we wanted to match all of this. So that's cool. Um, all right, and let's just now handle our groups properly. So with the value syntax, we already had this parse value syntax function that should work as before. So instead now I can just call parse value syntax of value syntax dot, dot group here to call the code that was working when we originally ran the test cases. I'll remove this line. And now we'll have to basically write a similar function for word syntax. I guess I should have kept these guys with the money conversion function. Um, so let's also define um, parse word syntax. I'll take in a string. And what do we want to do? I'll just pass this for now. We can come back to it in one sec. And I guess ultimately we probably want to return this. Oh, and I guess the only issue here, no, I guess we're good. Depends on if we want to replace the commas before or after. All right. I'm just gonna say return none here. Okay, I'm gonna real quick, just see if that changes anything. Ideally, we should have the same four tests pass. I don't know if any others will pass. It might, we might get lucky on some because the none is here. And I think some of the test case assert is none. All right, we've passed five tests now. So if we look at the tests that were passed. Same four tests as before, so that's good that this if statement's working well, but um, we failed all the others. So I think if we build out word syntax, we'll probably be pretty good there. So let's do that. All right, so ultimately we have an easy time getting a number like 12.2 out of the string. So really what we need to do is just multiply that 12.2 by whatever the modifier is here. So what I'm gonna do is write another function. I'm gonna just call this def um, 
word to value and we'll pass in a word. And ultimately we're just gonna define a dictionary. So I'll call this the value dict, which maps each one of these options to its corresponding numerical value. So we could do thousand, that would map to 1000, million would map to million, and then finally billion would map to one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. If you really wanted to, for good measure, you could do trillion, but no um, movies are in the trillions of budget, uh, trillions of dollars for budget or trillions of dollars for um, box office. But if you wanted to be safe, you could do that. And then all we would do here is just return the value dict of whatever word we pass in. So if we pass in a thousand, this function will return us 1000. If we pass in a million, this function will give us the integer million, etc. All right, so now let's start filling in parse word syntax. Well, first off, let's just print out what the parsing of the word syntax will do. So let's just print out our string that we're working with. So if I did parse word syntax and I passed in word syntax dot group and we passed in 790 million, let's say, what does that give us? gives us the string 790 million. So now we need to figure out how to really separate, you know, the 790 from the million part. And there's multiple ways you could do this. I think you probably could be safe to split it on the space and then just grab what's after on the right as the, your, you know, your million thousand billion word and the stuff on the left as your value. It's one way to do it. We're using a lot of regexes though right now, so we might as well maybe just continue that and just use regexes to match these things. So let's do that. So I'm gonna say that our, first off, I guess let's get our value. So our value is gonna be, if we have a string like 790 million, we can get a value the same way we did with, I would say the parse value stuff down here. So if we do regex.search, um, number, string, uh, and we do group. So now we're just getting the number part of what we have in all of this. And it's gonna be the first match of the number, so you'll see why this is important in a sec. And for good measure, we probably should also just potentially um, replace the commas out of this in case we have like 1,290 million. I don't know why they would format it like that, but it's good to capture all the edge cases we can. So honestly, I'm gonna just repeat this code down here. So I guess we could say value string equals this. I'm gonna just completely copy and paste. Ah, oh, no. <laughs> All this, paste. And you know, I guess good code practice, you probably have this also in its own function, uh, but I'm only gonna do so much for the video. Okay, so the value would get the same way in the word syntax one, but now we also wanna get the word, which is either thousand, million or billion. And so to do that, we could do regex.search. The pattern we're looking for ultimately is amounts. And we wanna see what where that exists in the string. And we'll find the first occurrence of that as well. And we'll do a group here. So I'm gonna real quick just print word out just so you see what happens. I th hope that the string, that's 790 million, will capture amounts and just give us million here. So that's my goal is that million prints out. Cool, that's good. And one thing that makes that really nice is like if, if people decided to do 790 millions, it would still just grab million because that's what we have in our match. And ultimately that's nice because that would now always make sure that if we see million, if we see billion, if we see thousand, that it always still maps exactly to what's in here. If we returned thousands and then we try to use this dictionary, it wouldn't work because thousands is not the same as thousands. So that's kind of one nice thing about doing this um, regex search method. And then the final thing I want to do is just do, I guess, word value. And that's going to be ultimately word to value of the word. And then finally, our ultimate return value should be the value times the word value. 
So if our string is 790 million or millions, however we want to put it, 790 gives us our first value here. And then millions gets converted into 1 million here. And we ultimately multiply that by the value to get our final answer. So save that and run the code. It looks like it's good, 790 millions. That's thousands or hundreds, thousands, millions. Awesome. So let's uh, run our tests again and see if we solved a bunch of them. So I'm just gonna clear, high test. PyTest, test money conversion to PY. Come on. Look at that, 12 passed now and three failed. What ones did we fail? Well, we failed one that is a list. So we just need to handle the list type. That's pretty simple. We just really have to grab the first item in the list and we'll use that. We failed one that it says 3.524 million, which makes sense. So we'll have to handle that edge case. And we also fail failed a range one like this, which is another edge case of the word syntax. So first off, let's fix the list example. So I would say if money or if is instance money and uh, is a list, let's just say that money is actually equal to the first item in the list. So money is zero. And just to show you where this would pop up, if we look at the list one down here, basically the code we just wrote is saying that if we get this list, what we're gonna do is just take the first element in the list and say that that's actually our money string. And then everything's the same as before. So honestly, already we could, just with that change, we could rerun it. I bet you when they have two failures. Look at that, 13 passed, cool. And again, like try to look through all your data and get a feel of like what types of edge cases pop up. We might not handle every single one with what we're doing right now, but we're trying to handle as much as possible to ultimately build out our, our data set and give us as much good information as possible. Um, so one thing that's fun is that we actually were passing this edge case, so that's cool. So really we just need to now fix these two edge cases. So that's pretty simple. We'll just have to build out what matches in our regex for the word regex right here. So right now it has to be a number and then immediately the amount. But basically what we can do here is optionally maybe have um, a dash character, which would handle this case right here. And if the dash appears there, then uh, we could have a, and we, it, the question mark is it exists or it doesn't exist. If it was multiple dashes, we wouldn't actually match that with the question here, followed by maybe another number. And again, we'll use the question mark. It, the number exists or it doesn't. And then followed by the space and the amounts as before. So let's see what happens if we save that and now run it. Look at that, 14 passed. And quick note, one assumption we're making here is that if we have a range like this, we're just gonna take the bottom value. We're gonna kind of take the lower limit. So that's why we get this test case equals that. So this one right here is very similar to the last one, but now instead of the dash, let's also check for a optional. So I'm gonna do or, so the straight line is or in regex syntax. Space character, backslash S is a space character. Um, two, backslash S, another space character. Save that, run it, no, run our tests. Hopefully they all pass now. Awesome, all of the tests pass. And as I mentioned, you know, this might not be every single edge case. Maybe it would be better to take the average of this range. You can build on this, but I think what we did here shows a good uh, you know, how we can use regexes to match the majority of cases that we'll run into in our data set. So our next step now is gonna just be taking all the code we rotate here and actually moving it to our 
uh, Jupyter Notebook and kind of uh, actually changing our, our data. All right, so we wanna go back ultimately to our Jupyter Notebook and we had all our monies here, but basically we now wanna copy in our code from before and paste it in here and change our Jupyter Notebook. So, copy all of this in in a sec. Um, actually, one thing I noticed real quick with regards to finding the word is that if I typed in something like 790 millions with a capital M, it wouldn't work properly. I also just like the idea of, we'll, we'll make a couple of uh, tweaks in a sec. Uh, but if it's a capital M, it doesn't work properly. So one thing that's good to do is to just add a flag. So I can do flags equals re.i, and that's gonna be ignoring the case of the um, word million or billion. And we'll do it also down here in the word syntax search, so flags regex dot ignore case, re dot i is ignore case. So if we run it again, and then I guess we have to lowercase it. Just a small edge case. All right, let's copy all of this in. And I think I see a couple changes I'm gonna make, but um, copy this in, open up our Jupyter Notebook, paste it all in. One thing that's annoying is we see that it's using, I think, spaces here in Jupyter Notebook world, but it's using tabs from Sublime. So yeah, these are tab characters. I wonder if I can real quick in Jupyter Notebook switch, uh, I think if I click tab size down here, indent using spaces. I just wanna do that to mirror my Jupyter Notebook. Oh, convert indentation to spaces, nice. So I'm gonna paste that in again. Cool, that's all the stuff I want. One thing to note real quick is we have a bunch of these not applicables here. So what we should add to our function is basically if money equals equals NA, then that's just return none. And I guess if we run into a syntax that doesn't match either of these, that's also return none. Okay, that's probably good. Let's run that real quick. Looks like everything's still working. Gotta hide all this real quick. Okay, now we need to actually need to convert it like we did for this one. So I'm gonna add, copy this, paste it down here. So now running time, let's say budget. And it's not really a float, it's a hint for movie.get. Let's see what it actually says. It's budget. Uh, I make this budget with a capital B, box office with a capital B. Okay, so budget. And then we'll also copy this line and do box office float. And this will be just box office and not applicable if it doesn't get that. And now it's not minutes to integer, but it's instead our money conversion function, money conversion and money conversion. So now we're modifying our movie info list with the, these two additional uh, fields. And let's run that. Hopefully we get no errors. Now let's see what our movie info list looks like. Movie info list. We'll just look at like a single example. Negative. I'm just. I'm really just picking random ones when I index this. I just don't want to look at too too much. 
Look at that. 160 is the... Oh, no. <laughs> it looks like we grabbed the group wrong. So we need to tweak this a bit. Uh, okay. All right. It's 160 here, but we really wanted to grab 160 times million. Why did that not work? Nice thing is we can just kind of paste this into our function, money conversion. Movie info list, negative 40. And then we'll get the budget from it. 160. Let's do some print statements in here. And I guess see if it gets to the word syntax, if that matches. So it looks like for some reason it's not matching the word syntax. I guess one of these last changes we made must have affected something. We'll print out the money real quick. That string is right. Hmm. It's number, then dash number. Here's if we passed in 160 to 2 million, what would happen? Why does it not match 255? Oh, it does now? What the heck? But if I do what we just did, Why does that not work? Is this some weird character that I'm not aware of? I'm gonna throw this in this string too. Wow, it's like a big dash. What the heck? That's strange. Man, that's annoying. <laughs> See, this is the type of thing that you you deal with, I guess. Let's now try it. Now it runs. Wow. Okay, I don't know what the deal is with that. But hey, you know, you know, you might run into more edge cases, but I'm glad that we figured it out. Like, if you see a lot of, you know, nuns that you, and you don't think it should be, I would recommend looking through your data a bit and trying to like correct things. I and that was a doozy just finding that dash, but um, that's kind of what it takes is like trying to break down, throw in print statements when you're you're trying to figure out something and uh, go from there. All right, so I think at this point we're pretty good with the money conversion. You can, you know, go through your data a bit more and see if there's any edge cases or things that were missing, but I'm gonna just kind of continue onwards and clean the last item I have on the list as the next step. So if we go back to our top of our list, we've now Converted the budget and box office numbers to two numbers. I'm gonna cross that off. So now the last thing we have to do is convert the dates into date time objects. So we'll create another field in our movie info list. Um, and we can go all the way down here to do that. So convert uh, dates into date times. All right, how do we wanna do this? Well, again, as always, it's usually good to just look at you know, a random element to kind of just fill, figure out what we're working with. Uh, so, you know, this one has two dates, so we'll have to probably just grab the first instance again. Uh, but basically, month followed by day, followed by comma, followed by year. 
that seems like what we're dealing with. Uh, as a good thing to do, this is what we kind of did with uh, the past examples, good to probably just print out all of our different options for dates just so we know exactly the, the edge cases that we're working with so do that right here so movie.get and now we're doing release date okay so I see yeah a lot of lists a lot of month day comma year month day comma year that seems like the main format. Is there any other formats that we see in here? That's, I think, the big question. It looks like maybe we need to replace the XA0 character. This is day, um, month, year. So that's a little bit different. I don't know if there's many of those cases. The main case is definitely either a string of month, day, comma, year, or uh, lists of multiple month, day, comma, years. You can look through that as much as you see fit. But let's start uh, implementing something that will help us out here. So the format we're mainly dealing with is like June 28th, comma, 1960, or 1950, let's say. So that's mainly what we want to convert when we're doing this. So I think when we're working with dates, I think one of the most important things is to import the date time library. So I'm gonna do from date time, import date time. This really allows us to convert to an object that Python understands as a date. And let's see, looking back at our options for dates here, we see that we have a lot of lists and a lot of stuff in parentheses too. I'm thinking if we clean out the stuff in parentheses, we might be left with a more succinct format. So I think the two steps we're gonna do here to start is grab, if instance of list, grab first item, and then just delete anything in parentheses, just so we have a very uniform month, day, year format. Let's do that. So we're gonna say dates equals movie, release date and I'll probably do dot get release date for movie and movie info list. Now let's define a function called a uh, date conversion and it'll take in a date. Well, the first thing we mentioned that we might want to do is if it is, an, this is just like our money conversion. I think also like our um, time conversion. So if is instance uh, date of a list type, let's just say our date is equal to date zero. Uh, okay, so that will give us our string no matter what. Now, what do we do with that string? Well, basically what we're going to want to do is make sure that it's you know just the date stuff here and not the parentheses stuff so maybe we also define a function that's just called like def uh, clean date i'll be passed in with the date too and what we're going to do there is just take our date so if we had something like this what I think would work well is that if we wanted to get rid of anything in the parentheses, what we could do is split it on the first uh, left parentheses. So I'm gonna do date.split on the left parenthesis. And then we can grab the stuff to the right of that. So that's gonna be this right here with an extra white space at the end. So that's gonna be the zeroth index. And then what we can do ultimately is just strip off the white space. So dot strip would allow us to do that. So I'm gonna just say return date. And now date conversion, we want a clean date. So I'm gonna just say date string equals clean date of the date. And now that's gonna leave us with, I'm gonna just say print date string. 
and we can run this for a few. Uh, so for dates in or for date and dates, let's try running date conversion. We see that that's given us what we're hoping for. So now let's use the date time library to actually convert this into a date time object. And we see we get like one not a here. So maybe we also add to our function. If um, date equals equals not applicable, then we'll return none. So now let's use yeah the daytime library to um, you know convert these into daytime objects. So I'm going to just say take date format convert to daytime Python. Converting strings to date time in Python. Okay, let's see if this gives us something that we want. Okay, so basically what we need to do is pass in our string and show the format that we expect it to be in. I think this will be easier if we go to the actual documentation for datetime library, datetime library Python. Because I know just having seen it before, I know that they give you a good list of things. So I'm going to look up strip time. That's what we saw before. Um, okay, this is helpful. Return a date time corresponding to a date string parsed according to format. So that's what we were just looking at. Date string format. And we can specify the format here. So we know it's month followed by day. So day like this. Then it's comma and then it was year. And year with four letters is percent Y. So you can basically format how your data is coming in to convert it properly using this syntax. So we can do, let's see, I'm going to say format, format equals percent B, that was month, percent D, which was day, comma year so that was percent big y so that's the format we're looking for so if we do we can do return date time dot strip time our date string and then pass in the format so i guess i need to move this up here So I'm gonna just also print a new line between this just to see what happens when we do the conversion. And I'll print this. Okay, so does that look right? 1937, May 19th, that looks good. Oh no, it looks good, but it looks like, okay, this is a different syntax. So it looks like we don't always have the same syntax. So this is day, month, year. So what we could do is make this formats, make it a list. And maybe we just try each format that's in there. So that's the first one. The second one we see that we just errored out on is day, month, year. So that would be percent D, percent B for month, and then percent Y for year. So now what we'll do is for format in formats, we will try to return this. And if it doesn't work, or ex I guess accept, you could print out the error or you could just, you know, pass if you don't care too much. And then if it doesn't fit either of those formats, we can say return none. So let's see what happens now. 
I'm gonna run this. So the one that broke was that weird one with the... Go up, go up, go up. I'm going, I scrolled down way too long. So we're looking for one with a day at the start. Okay, 26 October, 1953. Look, that works well now, cool. We might see a nun in here somewhere. Everything looks pretty dang good, in my opinion. Honestly, I think we might be good here. And once again, there might be some edge cases. Like we see we have some nuns because these are just years. And you know, maybe you handle those, maybe you don't. But for the majority, this already worked pretty well. So I think we can go ahead and I'm gonna just remove this real quick. I'm gonna remove the print statement here. Um, rerun the cell. And then what we're gonna do is just like we've been doing for, for a movie and movie info list, we will say movie um, release date. I'm gonna just say that this is like the formatted one. I you maybe say date time, just to show it's a date time object. Um, it's gonna equal date conversion of movie.get. release date or not applicable and close off. Oh, that's probably good. Run that. And now let's just look at a random movie info list. Release date, look at that, it's a date time object. That will be helpful if when we like want to look at these things uh, in uh, Pandas, uh, in analysis step. And January 25th, 1961, it matches it, cool. That looks good. So I think that at this point our data is clean. That was a hefty cleaning process. There's still uh, you know, additional cleaning that could be done, but uh, I'm trying to make this it's already a pretty long tutorial, but I'm trying to uh, give you a sense for as much as possible while still making it end eventually. So I think that's good for what we need to do. Our next step is going to be um, attaching IMDB scores, Rotten Tomatoes scores, et cetera, to our data set. All right, at this point, I think it makes sense to save our data again. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's just make sure that our save data function is loaded in. Run the load data just for good measure. Um, okay, so save the data. So save data. We can call it now maybe like Disney movie data cleaned more. I don't know, just some intermediate, just to kind of show the different stages. Dot JSON, and we want to pass in our movie info list. Run that. No. Okay. Um, so let's see what our error is. Object of type date time is not JSON serializable. So that's, we have an issue with the field we just added. So one thing that we can do here is there's multiple ways to save data in Python. So if you wanna save like pretty much any type of data in Python, you can also use what's called um, pickle. You can pickle the, the data. So we can pickle this movie info list and that would be another way for us to save it. So you could like do another Google search, like um, save um, a Python object pickle. I figured out how to do this. Um, that doesn't look super straightforward. Ah, oh, that's decent. Uh, save and load pickle Python. That'll probably give us enough information. I'm gonna use pickle to save a dict. That's probably close enough because we have a list of dictionaries. Okay, try this. That looks pretty straightforward. Um, so we'll use this. We'll basically make new, I guess, save and load functions using pickle. So let's we'll just paste that in. So now we want this to be Disney 
movie data cleaned more dot pickle and we'll move this into a function called uh, save data pickle I guess and take in data indent this indent this and just call this f f I don't really know what the protocol pickle highest protocol does so you probably can leave that in or you could remove it shouldn't matter too much. Okay, so that's a save data pickle method. We have to import pickle. Um, so that's save function. And I guess we shouldn't, we should also give it a name. We shouldn't define the name in here. So I'll just do this as name. And we want to dump the data. So that's the save function. We can run that. And now let's also do a uh, load function. So import pickle def uh, load data pickle, we'll call this name indent indent. And usually when you have pickle data, it'll either be dot pickle or it'll either, also sometimes you see dot pkl. Uh, name, then we really want to just return whatever it does. So return pickle.load, I'll call this F, call this F. Doesn't matter what you name that. Uh, and this should be name. So now we can go ahead and save our data by running this cell, doing save data pickle, we'll call it Disney data, uh, movie data, cleaned more dot pickle and we want to save the movie info list run that and now if we open up our folder where we have this we see that we have Disney movie data cleaned more dot pickle and that just to show you that it works with the load data we could then call like a equals load data pickle of the name, pass in the same exact name. Run that, and then if we did A of five, we see that we get exactly what we wanted and it was able to save that uh, date time object, which is cool using, that's a, a good reason to use pickle. Um, it's a you know, you can't pass a pickle, if you were to send this data set to someone, you wouldn't send them a pickle file probably, unless they're also a, a you know, someone that's familiar with Python. So that's kind of the trade-off with like the pickle file. You can save pretty much anything, but it's a little, you know, it's not like a human readable file. You have to ultimately uh, load it back in to get what you want. And if we showed, I could do A equals equals um, movie info list and just show that it's the exact same thing as it was before. It's pretty cool. All right, let's move on to one of the final tasks, which is to connect IMDB scores, just movie ratings in general to our data set. All right, so in this task, what we're gonna be doing, and just in case you stepped away and are you know just starting this task now, we can reload our movie info list by doing movie info list equals load data pickle of Disney movie data uh, cleaned more dot pickle or dot pickle and just a reminder we have that that's if you look in the github repo these functions are available or you could just duplicate them so we use this function um but what we want to do now is if we look at one of these movies let's just you know search back like negative 60 so we have the movie Into the Woods. And so what we are really wanting to do here is in this dictionary, we really want to add like IMDB score, Rotten Tomatoes score, etc. So feel free if you want. I'm going to give a couple hints because it's very broad still this task right now. But feel free to pause the video and play it when you uh, are ready. But I will real quick dive into a good spot to look for these scores and easily access them. So loading in another web page, let's just look up like IMDB scores 
um, imbb.com. I'm going to just search here, like uh, into the woods. So 2014 movie. And you know, we see it as a 5.9 uh, IMDb score here. I can make this a little bigger so you can see everything. So really what we need to know is how can we programmatically do that? One way might be to try to scrape like imdb.com and like rottentomatoes.com and I think Metacritic is one of them we'll be able to access. But as a programmer, you know, we can scrape. We know how to scrape this whole video we've been scraping. But I also often like to know if there's an API that we can use. So I would look up something like movie data API and see what you find. Uh, so there's like the movie database API looks like. It's probably pretty good. Uh, I've played around with this, this, uh, with this before. So we're gonna use the OMDB API, the Open Movie Database API. Um, and what you see if you start using this API is that I think you get a thousand free hits on the API a day if you are not a patron, Patreon, Patreon. Uh, but it's a $1 a month um, charge to be a patron, but yeah, you don't have to do that. Um, if you don't want, you can utilize just a thousand free ones a day. Um, so basically you can get a API key by going on the site, going to API key, um, getting the free one, and then you know filling it out. And it should be pretty quick. When I did it, it was very quick, but I'm not quite sure because I did end up being a, a Patreon and, and uh, paying a dollar a month to support this API. So what does the, the Open Movie Database API look like? Well, we can go to usage here. Basically, it gives us this endpoint to hit. We need to use our key, but what we can do is we can start searching by title. So I could do something like Into the Woods and search that, get a response in JSON, and we see that it gives us a bunch of data on that. And we see that you know one of these values, if we go way down here, make it even a little bit bigger, is the IMDB rating. So that's perfect. That's what we just saw with the 5.9. So this is already has um, that built into the API. One thing I would also note is that this has a lot of the same fields uh, that we collected during our scraping process. And I think one thing to, that's cool to think about is like basically what we did, if you took it like the uh, a few steps further, you could probably replicate an API like this uh, on your own. And that's something that maybe you could, you know, make a Patreon for, for people to access. Um, so it's kind of cool seeing that like basically what we did is what this person does. And uh, if you look at his Patreon page, this person offers this API and they have like 2,286 Patreons that are using it. So they're, you know, bringing in, if everyone, let's say, lower minimum is using $1 per month. That's a nice uh, little cash on the side. So that's pretty cool. So basically what we're doing is what this person did, but this person, I would say, has a more polished um, API and they, you know, they're hosting it on a server, et cetera. We have kind of a more static database right now. Uh, but that's kind of beside the point. Let's start accessing the 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 Let's start accessing this API. So yeah, you had to get this API key, use your email, they'll send you a key, but we can now you know, copy this, go back to our Jupyter Notebook, and you know, let's just paste this in just so we have what the format looks like, where we'll basically make requests. All right, so to solidify the task, what we wanna do is we want to attach IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, and I'll also add um, Metascore to that, um, to our data set. And we'll use this API. So I'd say go ahead at this point, 
pause the video, try to do this on your own, and then resume when you want to see how I would uh, do it. All right, so when we're working with APIs, the first thing that I think is important is to import the requests library. And so ultimately, we will have kind of our URL that we'll be making requests to. So I'm going to just call this base URL equals this. And then we're going to have to pass in parameters. So what are our parameters? Well, our parameters are going to be a dictionary of different things that we'll be wanting to pass in. If we go back to the API, we see that we can pass in, the biggest thing I wanna pass in is, you know, we have to pass in the API key, that's one parameter. And then we also have to pass in the title. So it looks like T, the parameter T is the movie title. So we'll use that when we're passing it in. So API key is going to be, all right, so this is a kind of a security thing. I could type in my key, you know, maybe my key is something like this, uh, but it's not good when I'm paying for a key, I'm paying that dollar a month fee for the key, it's not good for me to expose that information. So what we can do, what the best technique to do is to use environment variables so I can kind of show this a little bit. If you're on Windows, it looks like this. Like I'm gonna type in my search bar environment variables, edit the system environment variables, environment variables. And what I can do is I can set a system variable. So I see I have OMDB API key and I'm blurring out what the actual key is, but I can set this variable in here and basically you know, you have to have admin access to access this on your Windows machine. It's a little bit different on a Mac or a Linux to set environment variables, but you can do a quick Google search and find it. But basically I set it here in the system variables and then I can access that value. So maybe I set it to be something like, this is not my actual key, but it, it was something like this. And that's what I set in that environment variable slot. How I reference it in Python is OS dot environ to get environment variables. And then it was called OMDB API key. That's what I gave it as a name. And so that is actually going to now look up in those environment variables and find the actual value that I have there. This is a really good practice because uh, especially for more sensitive API access and you know things that you really can't have throttled and people abuse, uh, you don't wanna be committing that to your public GitHub repo. And also this is very true too for like passwords. You don't want passwords to be publicly accessible on GitHub, GitLab. So you can use environment variables to hide that information. Um, but the other thing we want is um, the title. And so how do we get the title? That's gonna depend. So we probably should wrap this in a, a function because the title is gonna depend on what we're passing in. So I'm going to call this get OMDB info, pass in the title, indent this. So now it's going to be whatever we pass into the function as one of our parameters. Okay, what do we do next? Well, we need to be able to make the proper request using the request library. So what we might want to do is encode this stuff onto this URL. And there's Python packages that can help us do this. So I'm gonna use the URL lib library to do this. And once again, if you ever forget how to encode something as a URL, Google search, figure it out, um, and then a copy kind of and paste your code in. So if we encode these parameters, I'm gonna call this params encoded equals URL lib dot parse dot URL, ah, dot URL encode of the parameters. So that just basically gives us a string that's now packaged up and we can attach to our base URL uh, to pass this information properly in a URL syntax. So then we have our full URL ultimately is going to be our base URL 
And I'm going to also add just a question mark here that signifies we're starting parameters uh, plus the params encoded. And then we need to make a, a request, uh, a get request to the OMDB API. And we can do that using the following requests.get. We want to pass in the full URL and then we want to get kind of the JSON response from that. I'm doing a lot of steps in one, kind of making this a bit quicker. Uh, but if you need to have any more information, look up the request library, look up the URL lib library, and I think this step will get more clear. Um, and so we can really return this, I would say. And let's see what this gives us. So if I do get OMDB info for the title into the woods, let's see if it works just like it worked when we were using their website. Look at that. So it gives us all of that information formatted as JSON, which we can access like a Python dictionary. We can easily get the rating from this. We can easily get the meta score from this. The Rotten Tomato score is a little bit annoying because it's hidden inside of this ratings list. It doesn't seem like it has its own field. So we'll have to do a little bit of extra work to get that. So let's maybe write one more function that's uh, get rotten tomato score. And we can have that pass in, you know, an OMDB info. So ratings, we'll, we'll grab the ratings from this because, so what I'm doing, just to clarify what I'm doing, we can easily add Metascore and IMDB rating to our uh, data set as is, but I just wanna have a function so that when we actually go ahead and do that, we can also add the Rotten Tomato score. So ratings equals OMDB info dot get of the ratings. And I'm gonna say an empty list otherwise if it doesn't um, return anything. So for rating in ratings, let's just print out the rating. I just want to show you what this is going to ultimately do. So if we uh, said that this was equal to info equals this, get rotten tomato score of info would print out this stuff. So then basically what we want to do is grab the source of that rating. And if it's equal to Rotten Tomatoes, that's what we want to grab. So if it's equal to Rotten Tomatoes, so I'm going to say if rating dot source or um, rating source equals equals Rotten Tomatoes, then um, our value that we want to return is going to be just the rating and then the value field. So that's how we can get the Rotten Tomato score. But we have to iterate over the list to do that. So that's kind of why we added this additional logic. And if ratings doesn't exist, it will blank to this default empty list. So it ultimately will return, we can have it it wouldn't be able to iterate over anything, so maybe we just have it return none in that case. Cool, that's uh, honestly, I think we just grabbed, using these two functions, I think we can grab everything we need. So let's go ahead and do that. So reminder, if we look at this, we're trying to add IMDB score, meta score, and Rotten Tomato score to this uh, dictionary, so let's kind of iterate across the dictionary like we have been. For movie, for movie in movie info list, we want to grab the title of the movie so we can use that in our search function. So that will be movie, let's see how we get the title, just called title in our dictionary. So we can do movie title and then once we have the title well we can get the omdb info it's going to be equal to 
get omdb info of the title. Once we have the omdb info, then we can start adding things to our dictionary. So um, imdb, I'm going to say, equals omdb info dot get of, um, let's see what it's called in, I want to print out an omdb info so we can check. So. Uh, it's called IMDB rating. So we can get the IMDB rating. And I'm using get just because we might run to the case where the score doesn't exist. So we don't want it to fail. And if it doesn't have the IMDB rating, we'll just say none. And you could maybe do some manual searching to find it. Movie, now that the meta score, so that's gonna be, we'll just say meta score. Well, if we look at our OMDB info, we can dot get the Metascore with a capital M to get this field. And we'll also say that defaults to none if you don't have it. And then finally, the Rotten Tomatoes. We can just do Rotten, I'm gonna do underscore tomatoes, so it's a single word. That's gonna be equal to OMDB info dot get Oh, actually, sorry, we can't get that because that's in this ratings thing. So that's why we wrote the function here, get Rotten Tomatoes score. So that's going to be just uh, get Rotten Tomatoes score of the OMDB info. That should be good. We can honestly, I think, run all this and cross our fingers that things work well. Come on. Might take a little bit because we're making a lot of API requests. It's going to be making like 400 API requests, probably. One thing I might have recommended doing is like grabbing the index of what movie you're on and printing that out because having that information can show how your progress is uh, coming along. Look at that. We got our, it ran. So now the moment of truth is in our movie info list. Do we have extra information? Cool, what is this movie? It's The Jungle Book. Nice. Uh, Rotten Tomato score, 94%. Meta score, 77. IMDB, 7.4. Nice, it looks like it's there. We can do some other checks, maybe grab like another one. Ooh, this one's rated badly. The Nutcracker in the Four Realms, 32, 39, 5.5. This is gonna be fun to have when we start doing analysis, but that looks good. One note I will say is that we only grabbed, you know, three things from the OMDB database. One thing that could be cool to do is it provides us additional information like genre. So as an extension to this task, you could add a genre to it. Maybe you could add plot to your database. You can add all sorts of new stuff. You could add awards. So. Use this however you see fit. When we actually start doing analysis, I might add some of the additional things, but that's out of the scope of this video. But I just wanted to mention it real quick. You could also potentially use this as kind of a cross-reference on uh, checking if you have the same exact information here as you do in our own database. That looks good. I'm gonna actually go ahead and save this as kind of like a final uh, thing. So save data pickle. I'm going to call this Disney movie data final dot pickle and we'll save in the movie info list. Awesome. All right. The last task of this video is going to be to save our data in a JSON file as well as a CSV file. So the JSON file, we've kind of done that throughout the video, but now we'll just have to fix that issue with the date time object not being serial serializable. Um, and then for a CSV file, this is definitely something that we'll want to do is convert our list of dictionaries into a CSV. So it's ultimately easy for us to analyze this data set in a future video. An optional extension you could do to this is to save your data in an actual database like MongoDB or, or an SQL database. Um, we're going to not do that in this video, but I do definitely recommend that's a, a good extension. One reason I'm deciding to skip that in this video is just that our data set is not that big. So it's still very feasible for us to just keep it in a JSON file or a CSV file. But 
for bigger data sets, it's definitely a good route to actually use a online cloud uh, database. All right, so how can we save this info, this data first as a JSON file? So to remind ourselves, we have the movie data info list or movie data info. <laughs> I forgot the movie info list. Sorry, I goofed. Movie info list. We'll just grab like the 50th element. Um, okay. And so really all we just need to do is just convert this one back to a string um, for this. So because this contains a list of dictionaries and dictionaries are mutable objects, we'll want to just copy this list. And to copy it, we can't just simply do like a, uh, you can't just assign a new variable to movie info list because that would still have the same pointers to these uh, dictionary objects. So how we're going to do this is I'll just say movie info copy equals movie dot copy for movie in movie info list. And that should give us a proper copy of everything because we're copying each individual dictionary. So now we can see that the movies are still there. If we do movie info copy, let's say 20, we see everything. And what we want to do is replace this field with an actual um, string instead of uh, a date time option, just to save it as JSON. So to do that, we could do something like for movie and movie info copy. Well, we want to edit the movie release date object. And that's going to be equal to, well, I guess first off, we should know what our initial movie was. So our, our current date is current date equals movie release date. So this is either going to be a date time object or it could be none as well. So if current date, so if it's not none, then what we want to do is take the current date and string format time it to be just like we kind of the reverse of what we did before. So percent B is month, percent D is day, comma, percent Y is year. And then otherwise we will have that same field be just none. So if it was none before, it stays none. So equals none. I guess this assigning it to none wouldn't change anything because I think the only possibility is either current date is defined or it's uh, none. So it'd stay none. But we can just do this for good measure. OK, run that. Now if we look at movie info copy 20, we see that this is now a string. That's perfect. And just to check. Let's just make sure our movie info list is still not modified and we see that it is just fine. That's great. And so now because we've just changed the one problematic field, we can go ahead and save this. So I can use the save data function that we defined a while back. And I call this Disney data final dot JSON and we can save the movie info copy into that. We will probably have to load in our save data function. Just gonna do that real quick. Go back and save. Cool. All right now we need to do our CSV. So insert some more cells. So how do we convert this to a CSV? Well, usually when we're dealing with CSVs, one of the libraries we love to use is pandas. So I'm going to do that import of that, import pandas as PD. And so what can we do with pandas to load in our dictionary, our list of dictionaries to a data frame? So I might just look up load list of dictionaries to data frame pandas and see if it gives us anything. Convert list of dictionaries to pandas data frame. 
Does this look, kind of look like what we have? Yeah, it does, I would say, in general. Wow. Supposing D is your list of dicks simply, all we have to do is that. That's easy enough. So we can just do um, data frame equals PD dot data frame. And we can just pass in our movie info list. We're gonna use our movie info list because it has the date time objects that will ultimately be helpful when we're doing analysis. And we can go ahead maybe and do, just to check things, df.head down here. So let's run both of those cells. And now what does the data frame head look like? Oh, look at that, does it look good? Title, looks like it has everything. We're not gonna analyze this right now, but one thing to note is a lot of these, I would say columns might not be necessary when we're looking at it as a CSV. So you can you know, decide to just filter this down more. Okay, everything's good. So if we wanted to save that, we could just do a data frame two CSV Disney movie data final dot CSV. Uh, that should be good. And we could see that we have that saved right here. Cool. And if you wanted you, you could start playing around with this data frame a bit. Do data frame dot info to see some info about the columns. So like we see that this is a date time object, which is good. One thing I noticed is that IMDB and Metascore Rotten Tomatoes are not integers. So one quick thing you could do is convert these to integers. Uh, but you know, it's ready really to analyze. So if you wanted to see like um, which movies are the longest, you could do something like running time times equals data frame dot sort values. We sort on running time, the integer version, and we could have it go ascending equals true. So we could see the shortest movies first and then get to the longest, I believe that would do. And if we printed running times dot head, oh no. Oh, I put this in the list. It should be outside the list. Run that. You see that we get like the shortest movies first, so like Roving Mars, Sacred Planet, Saludos Amigos, those are all pretty short. We could even get more if we wanted. Uh, Bambi is pretty short, it looks like. Winnie the Pooh. So we see that this is in order of the length. Uh, I guess we see the integer number here. That looks good. You could do the reverse. You could do find the longest by doing false. And Pirates of the Caribbean, I guess is long, etc. So you can do a bunch with this now. We have everything there. There's you know some minor cleaning, but we're gonna do a bunch of analysis in a future video, but we've created a data set. We've scraped a bunch of Wikipedia pages, did a bunch of cleaning on those Wikipedia, on what we collected, used an API to add info to our table. We've done a ton of things. So nice work with all of your efforts in this video. Gonna be a future video where we analyze all this data sometime in the future. This video took a lot of effort to prep. So if you did enjoy this video, it'd mean a lot to me if you throw it a big thumbs up. Also, if you haven't already, it would mean a lot if you subscribe to the channel. If you're looking for more exercises to do, check out my other videos, as well as make sure to check out Data Camp. I have a link in the description to that. To stay up to date on everything that I'm doing, make sure to follow my socials, Instagram and Twitter. But without further ado, I think that's all we have for this video. So thank you everyone for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this one. This was a heck of a project, so uh, I had a lot of fun putting it together and I hope you had a lot of fun kind of solving the tasks on your own. Until next time, peace out.